Hey, welcome everyone. So it's about time for another review. And this particular review, uh, I gotta tell you, um, I'm having a little bit of a neurotic episode after watching this particular video. Let me give you a little backstory. So let me make it very clear before I even get into all this. Uh, I don't know Rebecca Watson. I've never talked to Rebecca Watson. I, of course, know of her. Anybody in the atheist, agnostic, theist communities on YouTube probably knows who Rebecca Watson is and her history, which I'm really not at all interested in. However, she did do a video that did interest me. It was a video on uh, agnosticism and atheism based upon a paper that she had read, which I kind of question if she actually read the entire paper. Uh, it was mind-blowing to me, just boggling to me, uh, the way she interpreted this paper. Now, again, I'm not going to try to like diss on her personally. I, I found out subsequently that she doesn't really do any erratas, meaning a uh, you know, a fixing, not erotic, erratas, uh, where you fix your mistakes in a paper, things of that nature. She doesn't usually correct anything. So I'm not expecting anything like that. Uh, I did offer for her to, to join me in a conversation, either on her channel or non sequitur. And of course, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, if, if she ever did, I'm completely up for it. So I was watching this particular video and the first time through it, I didn't read the paper, obviously. I didn't read it either because I wasn't familiar with the paper because that's what the video was about. After I read the paper and I rewatched the video, uh, yeah, it, it was it was pretty bad. So I thought I would kind of go through her video first and then kind of look at the paper and some of the um, citations of the paper and then kind of open this up for you guys to come in if you want and talk about, uh, you know, maybe some of her misunderstandings of the paper or how I, how I just don't think she, she did the paper justice by any stretch of the imagination. It's not a very complicated paper. Um, you know, the only thing complicated about a lot of these psychological papers, you know, sociology papers, are the methodologies, which I'm not really that interested in. The method section is not really of importance to me. You know, I don't intend to recreate any of these types of experiments or these types of surveys. Uh, yeah, they're kind of interesting to know how they kind of went about to, you know, ask these questions. But, I mean, really, I'm just more interested in the, in the body of the paper and the conclusion. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to just start her, her video and kind of pause it. It's not a very long video. It's only about 12 minutes, which means it'll probably take me about an hour to get through it, right? I know how I am. But, uh, you know, I'm going to try to work through it pretty quickly. I, I, I may do it at one and a half speed. Uh, let me know how the audio is. If, if I can speed it up a little bit and make it a little quicker, I'm happy to do so because I watch most of these videos at pretty quick speed either, uh, as well as me. Uh, and so I don't mind doing it at one and a half speed. Now, I did watch it at the second time. At first, at first I think I watched it at, at fast speed. The second time, I was like, oh, I got to slow this down because uh, I want to make sure that I don't misunderstand her. Because, of course, if I'm going to do a review, I want to steal man somebody, right? I don't want it to take an uncharitable interpretation of what a person is saying. I don't think that's fair. If you're going to review something, I think you should take it in the most um, strongest charitable light you can, right? That way, if they have any counter argument to what you're saying, they're going to they're going to have to at least you know come up with some really good argumentation. That's what all these things are about. They're argumentations. So, anyways, we welcome everybody out there right now. I see some familiar names. Uh, if you would like, please share this this video on social media everywhere, and maybe we get some eyes on it because I think this is going to be a pretty good review. I I do. There's a lot to cover here, though, um, and so I really kind of had to, to even think to myself, how do I even want to approach this because there, there's a lot of technicalities in this in this particular subject matter. But I'm just going to do do what I always do, just kind of just wing it, right? Uh, people says, unfortunately, I've already seen it annoyed me throughout. You're not the only one. Uh, I'm getting already some feedback on that particular video. And the people that I know that are in the know and that know what they're kind of talking about, they were not impressed by this particular video. Okay. They, they definitely think that she uh, misunderstood, grossly misunderstood the point of the paper. Uh, and you'll see that uh, from my personal viewpoint, she did what was called, called an eisegesis versus an exegesis. And in, to anybody who knows about textual criticisms or hermeneutics, uh, when you're reading something, you, you like the biblical scriptures or things of that nature, and you want to know how the, the mind of the author was was thinking, and you want to read, you want to basically read it as the author, uh, the author's intent, right? You want to do an exegesis on it. You don't want to read in all your biases. You don't want to read in all your other stuff of what you think that the author meant, because then you're not doing a, a, a proper textual criticism criticism on the paper. And so she, you'll, you'll see, you see if you agree with me as we go on, that she did it, um, uh, an eisegesis. She, she didn't critique the paper for what it was saying. She critiqued the paper for what it didn't say or how she wanted it to be, which is not how you do a review. Uh, and again, this is, this is giving you a little foreshadowing, right? A little um, uh, advanced 
uh, predictions of what I think you guys are going to come to. Again, I'm not trying to sway you, but I'm not trying to sway you on anything. I'm just giving you the information and let you guys kind of go from there. So with that said, make sure the audio is okay when I'm playing this video. Nothing worse than playing a video and nobody can hear it. I think I've got the uh, settings down pretty well, but, uh, you know, didn't, I, did, I did it the other day on the non sequitur and I had never heard the end of it. So I'm, I'm still trying to fix the audio stuff, but I, I think I've got it pretty well working. So let's kind of dive into this. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it is kind of complicated and it's kind of not. She's way overthinking this to, to, to start off. I mean, she's way overthinking it. Um, the simplicities of, of atheism and agnosticism are, 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 at least in the ontological sense, it's pretty simple. And I don't know why people tend to uh, complicate it. But, uh, oh, no, no audio? No audio. Okay, let's try that again. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, this, I'm glad you guys started. <laughs> I'm glad I'm watching the live chat. Yeah, because exactly what I said. Audio issues always, right? Every time, I'm telling you. So, all right, now I think I fixed that. Let's try this again. Ready? Here we go. Actually using the definitions oh, yeah. of each other. A new study right. endeavors to explain the difference between atheists and agnostics. And I don't mean in the actually using the definitions of each of those words and exploring the philosophical similarities and differences between them. I mean, just asking people which one they self-identify as and then what other things they self-identify as. It's, it's kind of complicated. Let's Not get really. into it. So first, my own background, I spent my first seven years attending a Christian Baptist church, my next 10 years oh, uh, considering <laughs> myself a Christian Baptist, and then the next 20 some years as an agnostic atheist. Okay. So right off the bat, she's, she's talking about her own personal um, uh, labeling of her, how, how she labels herself. Um, which is completely irrelevant as far as this paper. This paper mentions absolutely nothing about agnostic atheists. Why? Because you don't find agnostic atheists in any kind of real literature. Um, it's talked about in passing, but anybody who knows about um, philosophy generally doesn't use terms like agnostic atheist. It's just it's incoherent. It's nonsensical. It's superfluous at best. Uh, and it's just not in this paper. The, the paper didn't ask people if they, they self-identify as agnostic atheists because it makes no sense to do so. And I've, I've talked about that numerous times, the links in the video descriptions if people want to know more about that. But already she's basically just setting this up as, oh, this is all my my labeling, but you know, the, the, the paper doesn't involve any of this. Why? Because why would, why would it? Why would it have anything to do with how she labels herself? Because the paper, she's already in misunderstanding, is just asking people why they are atheists over agnostic and the personality traits that you'll generally find or they suspect to find. This was, these were, um, again, uh, they, they, were, they were hypothesizing that if you are agnostic or an atheist, you would have certain traits. That's basically what the paper was about. Things that you would tend to more than anything else. And they wanted to see basically um, what the tendings of agnostics versus atheists were. And they very clearly define what they mean by atheist and agnostic. Uh, they, they clearly define it by what is understood in philosophy, not how she thinks she reads the dictionary. That's right. Uh, I'm every conservative Christian parent's worst nightmare, a pious god botherer who went away to college, took one philosophy class, and immediately became a non-believing socialist asshole uh yeah once philosophy class and that shows by the way and by the way by the way you don't have to have a lot of philosophy courses i only had minimal philosophy courses i took a course in contemporary rhetoric and in formal logic the rest i've taught myself for the last i don't know what decade um but you know you'll see that the one philosophy course didn't give her the the insight to understand this paper to do a proper exegesis on it no possible way you may immediately notice that I describe myself using both of the terms that I previously suggested yes, I are mutually exclusive, agnostic and atheist. I'm both uh, because they're actually terms that address very different things. Though. No, no, th no, they don't. Not OK. Let me make this very clear to all the atheists out there that I think that they could watch atheist experience and understand agnosticism. 
You can't. It's a very complicated position as far as if you want to talk about the historical context of agnosticism and how Thomas Henry Huxley coined the term. If you actually get into modern contemporary analytic philosophy, I will tell you, any way you go read, that agnostic and atheism are mutually exclusive positions. Now, there are people that are outside of the philosophical community and more in the psychological communities that will uh, advocate for agnosticism to be held in the epistemic sense, as in the epistemological understanding of God nullability. That's fine. If you want to use agnostic like that, no big deal. That's, that's stating that you're using it in the epistemological sense. But when we're talking about the, the ontological status of God, if God exists or not, we don't care about the nobility of God. It's irrelevant. We don't go around saying, hey, what's your position on you know, climate change? Oh, I'm, I mean, I believe there's climate change, but I don't know. Nobody does this. You're not an agnostic climate changer, right? Agnostic is understood in the domain of discourse for philosophy on talking about the existence of God, of somebody who's undecided that God does not exist and God, or they don't hold the position that God exists, nor do they hold the position that God does not exist. It has absolutely no relevancy, none, to the nobility of God in the ontological domain. In other words, relating to God's nobility. If you say, does God exist? There are two direct answers. Yes, no. There are indirect answers. I don't know. I don't care. What's God? But there's only two. Yes, theist. No, atheist. Period. Two direct answers. And a lot of atheists want to get away from that does God exist question, which is the great debate community question. It has been the great debate question, not just in the community, but the actual great debate question for hundreds of hundreds of years. It's not, do you believe in God? That has never been the question of atheism. The question of atheism is, does God exist? So, so she, she's already throwing in her own personal views of how to read this paper, which is going to be doing, like I said, an eisegesis, not an exegesis. So many people don't realize this or don't use them in that way. I'll also note uh, that I am a language descriptivist, not a prescriptivist, uh, which means that I believe words mean what most people think they mean and not necessarily what the dictionary says they mean. Okay, so I agree with her on that. I'm a descriptivist. I wrote a kind of a, an essay called My uh, by Description. If you go look at Academic EDU and look at my name, you'll see it. I put it under a draft because I didn't want to put it as a paper like I did with my other one. Um, but basically... Uh, words describe usages, but there's also different types of usages in different domains of discourse. In general parlance, in other words, in commonalities between how people speak on the street, words may be used differently than in a technical field. I think everybody is aware of this. Math actually does get into that. So words describe, and we're talking about labels like agnostic atheist. That doesn't describe anything coherently. It's ambiguous and multiple different in multiple different ways. Matter of fact, I have challenged people multiple times to come up with a logical schema to have a coherent system on a multi-axial diagram that makes sense for for Gnostic atheist, uh, Gnostic atheist. None of them ever have. I, I at this point, I just don't think it's possible. I could be proven wrong on that, obviously. But as of now, I hold the position it's just not possible. I I, I used to be like I, I don't know if it's possible or not. But after doing this for so long, and nobody's been able to do it, and and me trying very hard. I think it's I think it's come to the conclusion it's just it's so ambiguous it's no possible way to do it. Uh, but again, change my mind on it. I'm fine. I'll correct myself. I'll do an errata uh, and say, yeah, you know what? Somebody did come up with a schema that does work. I don't use it, but at least it's logically coherent because so far nobody has. Uh, but as of now, nobody nobody has so. But sometimes, especially in a scientific or a philosophical context, it's useful to keep distinct meanings for words independent of what the general population believes. Like Agreed. when we talk about evolutionary theory as opposed to your theory that your cat is secretly trying to kill you. Theory might mean something different scientifically uh, because it's still useful in that respect. So it is Okay, so I happen to agree with her on this. So this is why it, there's an inconsistency here because if she's going to hold that certain words have different uses between the common layperson and... Uh, and as opposed to within a uh, uh, educational uh, field, then why would she take atheist agnostic and, and use like a lay ex lay definition for them, right? Why would she say, oh, theory means you know something different in science, which it does. It's a well substantiated body of evidence that makes uh, accurate and testable predictions, um, and repeatedly makes these um, predictions, as opposed to a guess, right? A creationist will say, you know, theory is just a guess. 
Why? Because dictionary. Uh, but then, she, then most of these new atheists will do the same thing with theory, and uh, should be with atheist uh, and agnostic. Like, oh, the dictionary says this. Well, yeah, but so what? In this is just describing how some people use atheists, and it is true that some people use atheists to mean just not a, a belief in God. Yeah, that's that is true. It describes usages. But that's not common. It's certainly not common worldwide, and it's not common in, in any academic domain. No college teaches that, I've found. I've not found one college that teaches this. Not one. Doesn't mean they don't exist. I'm just saying that I haven't found one. If you know of one, great. Show me, and I'll be like, okay, this college teaches. I want to reach out to that instructor. I know, I mean, there is one professor right now that we'll get into that I disagree with his blog, uh, but he advocates for something along those lines. He, he's a, he advocates by definition of atheist from the Oxford English Dictionary, which is, by the way, diachronic, not synchronic. So it, it makes no sense to me, by the way. And he's also not a, a philosopher. He's a cultural uh, psychologist. But... Uh, for her to have the same standard, uh, you know, this one, or me, this one standard as far as theory, but not as an, an atheist, seems inconsistent to me. Because if you go read the academic literature, like the paper she's going to be describing, it clearly defines how it's using atheist and agnostic. It isn't how she's using it. And 99% of the papers out there do it that way. So I don't know why she would want to say, yeah, Theory is used, you know, in one way in science, but, you know, in, in par, par, common parlance or um, lay speak, yeah, it just means guess. Okay, but that's not how it's used academically. Atheism academically is almost ubiquitously held as the belief that God does not exist, the theory does not, the theory there's no God, the dogma there's no God. These are just normative things. These are just everywhere. Go read the papers. This is what I'm saying. I, I don't understand atheists that are so dead set on dying on the hill that atheism is some lack of belief when nothing out there really supports this beyond the fact that lay atheists use it. I mean, you, have, you only have four names, and three of them are dead, that ever advocated for them, for that particular usage. Anthony Flew in 1972 on his Presumption of Atheism. A paper on um, the, presump the Presumption of Atheism. You had um, Dr. Um, George Smith, uh, he wrote a book called Atheism, A Case Against God. There was Steve Bullivant, who writes the priest, he's the editor and write, wrote the preface uh, for um, Oxford Handbook uh, of Atheism, and who's, by the way, a theist. He's the only one that's still alive. And Mark, Michael Martin, who wrote um, a book on uh, negative atheism. But other than that, you don't find it that much. It just, it just doesn't, doesn't exist. Steve, your on-screen live check is on drugs. Oh, let me look here. Do I have it on there twice? Let me fix this. Thank you for pointing it out. Yes, it is. It's on crack. Let me fix this. There we go. This is why I like in real-time feedback. So thank you, live chat, for pointing that out to me. Yes. Continue. It is with atheist and agnostic. When I say that I'm an agnostic atheist, this is what I mean. Gnosticism refers to knowledge. Is it possible to know with absolute certainty whether or not there is such a thing as a god? In general, no. I okay. No, 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 no. Okay, when I hear an atheist say that a uh, gnostic, uh, gnostic has to acknowledge, I immediately think to myself they've never read anything about gnosticism or, or gnosticism. Right with a, with a big G. Let me make this very clear. Agnosticism was a term coined by Thomas Henry Huxley, and he actually meant it as a what's kind of a more of, of a normative scientific theory or methodology that people should not believe something without scientific reasoning, scientific facts to back them up. He felt that the people of his time uh, that were claiming that they knew God exists or believe God exists, even even Dostoevsky wasn't even so much about knowledge, but even the, the belief that God exists, they were unjustified to do so. So he coined the term agnosticism, and he based it on gnos, G-O-N-S, which he meant to have representative, representative of the illusion of having knowledge. Agnostic, the word agnostic, which did come from gnos, gnosos, uh, gnos, gnosis, um, but gnosis was not about epistemic knowledge. Gnosis was not about the knowledge that she was referring to. Because she gets in to talk about agnostic atheism. No. Gnosticism was actually a, a form of uh, belief. It was, a, it was a derivative of Christianity to some extent. But it was actually between the 1st and 4th century. And there's many, many different types of, of, of Gnosticism. There was many different branches. There was the um, 
during the Hellenistic period especially, but there was the uh, Arcanites, there was the, uh, uh, what's the, Val the Valentines, the uh, Sethians, but they all had one thing kind of in common. They bl believed that this being that was in the Old Testament, the, the God of the Old Testament, so to see, speak, was a very maniacal, evil being. It wasn't the God that the Christians worship or think that they're worshiping, right? Uh, they believe that this particular being uh, created the, 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 the universe that we live in, but didn't create the celestial sphere. That was created by what's called the unknown God in Gnosticism. And so this, this evil being, this evil God, uh, he, he basically confused people at the very beginning. And during the time of Adam and Eve, he created Adam. Uh, and one of the, the archeons, which is basically these world powers that created the world with this, this one God. Uh, this, I think the God was called, um, uh, goodness, it's been long. um, hang on, I'll tell you, um, uh, Yaldabaoth, uh, yeah, Yaldabaoth, I'm probably butchering his name, Yaldabaoth. But Yaldabaoth was the original god of the Old Testament that, that came to be later known as Yahweh. But Yaldabaoth was probably some kind of demon in, in the Gnostic form. But this was the being that actually created the universe. And so he created Adam and Eve, but in doing so, uh, he left out knowledge of this unknown god that created the, sphere, the, the celestial spheres, the heaven called uh, uh, Plamora. And one of the Archeons, the lesser of the Archeons, was named uh, uh, Sophia. And Sophia was kind of uh, wanting to make this universe as well. She, they were called emanations. And in doing so, she fell from the state of grace. But when she fell, she instilled all humanity, everybody who lived, with a divine spark. A, that would, divine spark was knowledge of the actual creator God, the of the of the of the Palmera, the the spiritual the spiritual realm, and if you could know about this other god, the unknown god, you could, be, could basically obtain apoptosis, which is divinity. You can get sal, you know salvation, and this was also what Jesus was preaching. Jesus was in the Gnostic tradition was a messenger, a messenger of of of, of God, saying, "Look, uh, if you get this knowledge." Uh, of the divine spark of Sophia, which was, was funny, was Sophia was in opposition to Jesus as far as male and female counterparts. It, it, one of the, the nicknames Sophia had was called Syzygy. Sister, and if you know about astronomy, Syzygy is basically related to the conjunction or opposition of the planets. Right? So when you have an opposition of the planets, uh, that's called a Syzygy. Well, Syzygy represents Sophia. And Sophia represents the divine spark that's instilled in everybody. That gnosis, knowledge, refers to. It was a spiritual knowledge, Rebecca. It had absolutely nothing to do with knowability. It had absolutely nothing to do with to know as an epistemic sense or how we view knowledge nowadays as justified true belief. It had to do with a very specific type of knowledge that Sophia, from the, from the Gnostic literature, if you, in the, what's called the, the uh, Nagamrami, I'm probably butchering that. I, I, I hate pronouncing these things. The Nag, Haram, Nag Harami, I believe it's pronounced, right? And it, it, I, I, again, I'm not a Gnostic, so I don't really dive into Gnostic literature that much. I've read, I've read some of it, and it's very interesting, actually. You know, the Gospel of Judas and, and the Pistis Sophias. But as far as like the, 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 the term knowledge, almost all the, the, uh, the, the Gnostic disciplines that I've read, the Arcanites and the Sophians, uh, excuse me, the uh, Sethians, the, they all believe that this divine spark was how you became one with divinity again. All of them. It was a very specific type of knowledge. And this is, this is not how you would use the term gnosis in agnostic atheist. It is absolutely incongruent. It has nothing to do with what you're talking about. Uh, Rebecca, so yeah, I, I, as soon as I hear somebody say the word, oh, agnosticism really knowledge, all they're doing is going to do a Google search and looking at the etymological roots and go, oh, look, it says knowledge. They're not understanding it's referring to a very specific type of knowledge, you know, excuse me, in the, in the Gnostic literature. And again, if you go up and read the Gnostic literature, there was a lot of type of Gnosis, Gnostics. And, but most of them believe that this, this, this evil being of the Old Testament, right, was had these demons called archeons and some people called them angels right even some of the gnostics disagreed they thought the archeons they were angels 
But most of the ones believe that there are some type of demons. They're also called principalities. And these principalities were related to the seven luminaries of the ancient world, which was Sun, Mercury, Venus, Moon, Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn. Saturn being the, the uh, god actually of the Bible, believe it or not, the, which would be Yahweh. So when she's talking about, I'm not, sorry, I didn't want to get too much of the whole Gnostic thing, but let's it, just to show you, though, the type of no, the knowledge that Gnosis referred to has absolutely nothing to do with what Rebecca's talking about. So a little bit of a tangent there. Maybe we'll do an episode on Gnosticism one of these days. Maybe we'll get somebody who actually really understands Gnosticism pretty well, and I think it'd be a fascinating topic. But yes, it has absolutely nothing to do with what she's talking about. And a lot of people have pointed this out. A lot of people have told people, look, stop saying agnostic or no, Gnostic has to do with knowledge. It, it, it very, only very in the loose sense because it's a, again, yes, sure, it's, it's knowledge, but not as you and I talk about knowledge. Not when we say we know this. I know A equals A, right? No, it was the knowledge of the fact that the original creator God, um, Yadabeoth, which again, became uh, Yahweh, and uh, and probably became Loki, because Yahweh Baoth was the god of chaos. Uh, and so it probably became Loki in the Norse tradition. But that's what it's referring to. Knowledge that he created this world as a dem great demurge uh, that sustains this world, as some form of, form of theistic personalism rather than the classical theism, where God created everything, you know, benevolent being and all this other stuff. No, in the theistic personalist point of view, there's a personalized God, which was kind of having these anthropomorphic characteristics, which was Yahweh uh, in the Gnostic tradition, who was this evil being. That's why you see such a differentiation between the Old Testament and the New Testament, where the New Testament is love, happiness, you know, love your brother, blah, blah, blah. And it, it, it describes God in a completely different way from the Old Testament, because the Old Testament, according to the Gnostics, that God did not give the information about the actual true God that created the heavens. But if you wanted to be saved, you would have to know about this. You had to have divine or hidden or esoteric knowledge of this d divine God, uh, divine spark that Sophia gave everybody. Now, again, this is completely different from what Christian literature teaches, right? There's obviously overlaps. But I wanted to make it clear to you, and I know I'm going very deep into this, and I don't mean to, but I want to make it very clear. Stop using this nonsense that agnostic has to do with knowledge when you're not understanding it, it happens to do with a very, very specific type of Gnostic knowledge. Well, that took a long time to get through that. My apologies. Actually, you know what? I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. I, I can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no Christian God or Muslim God or Jewish God or Egyptian God or Zoroastrian God or unicorns or Santa Claus or any other magical being that disappears whenever you try to look too closely for it. And I'm an atheist because I believe that none of those things exist. I believe. Okay. So, first of all, you don't have to prove anything when you, when you talk to this stuff, right? These are just beliefs, right? It doesn't relevant whether you can prove it or not. But she says very clearly here that she's an atheist because she believes those things don't exist, right? And again. God or unicorns or Santa Claus or any other magical being that disappears whenever you try to look too closely for it. And I'm an atheist because I believe that none of those things exist. I okay. So she has a positive epistemic status. Right? She's an atheist in the philosophical sense. Why would you then want to combine that and juxtapose that with the term agnostic? It's irrelevant to the question being asked as far as what is your beliefs. We just want to know when we're talking about a dosastic state, what you believe. We, it's not, we don't care. I personally don't care what you claim to know or not. If I just want to know, do you hold this particular belief? Right? So if I say, do you believe in God? Yeah. You're a theist. No. Atheist. She would answer no because she believes there's no God. That's that's all you need to do because there's a position called agnostic, which is somebody who is neither going to answer yes or no. Now you have this problem of equivocation. You have the problem of ambiguity about what do you mean by agnostic because if you say you're agnostic atheist, does that mean you're agnostic on the proposition and you just lack a belief, which, by the way, is logically ambiguous, or is it that you believe there's no God, but you're not claiming knowledge, which, by the way, is just atheist. It's superfluous to have agnostic atheist at that point. What is it that you mean? Um, and there's many different versions of agnostic atheist. Some people say it means that you believe there's no God, but you're not certain. Some people say you believe there's no God, but you don't know. Some people say that uh, Gnostic with a G, atheist, means that you believe there's a God and claim there's you know there's a God. Some people claim that you not just know there's a God, but a certain there's a God. And one thing to keep in mind, which I'm sure Beck, Rebecca knows, knowledge is a subset of belief. Knowledge is also, a certainty is a subset of knowledge. 
This is a linear scale. It's not an orthogonal scale. It's not a, it's not a, a multi-axial diagram when it comes to beliefs and knowledge. That's silly. It's a linear because if these are subsets, I mean, you have one super sub, you have one superset, which would be certainty, right? We'll call it epistemic certainty. You, it's not that you, you know, you think that you're you're certain. It is you cannot be wrong, kind of stuff. That's epistemic in the Descartes sense. And then you just have no, no, I know this. And then you just have belief. These are all again subsets. So if you had a scale between zero and one, right? Where zero would be, well, actually, I would say negative one and one. Let's that's be better. Negative one and one. That's your that's your range. Negative one would be would be equivalent to you have um, absolute certainty that there is no God. One, you have absolute certainty that there is God. Zero, be agnostic. You're in the middle, and then anywhere on that spectrum. So if you tend more toward like theism of a certainty of a one, let's say you're at 0. 0.5. Well, that would mean that you believe there's there's a God. But you're not claiming knowledge, you're not claiming certainty. Now, if you say you're 0.99% rather than 1, that would mean that you're probably claiming knowledge but not certainty. So there's different degrees of scale. Matter of fact, one of the papers that, they, that mentioned in the paper that we're going to get into talks about how the study was done, and all they really wanted to know was the, what's called the valence and the strength. Valence is basically positive or negative. Do you believe God exists or do you believe God does not exist? Valence. Or... Um, the strength of it, the strength of your conviction. How how strongly do you believe this? And they the, and I'm not going to get into the method section of this paper, but just so you, when we get into it, you know how the method they use. It was very similar to anybody who's ever gone to take a uh, exam to get a job. They ask you these really weird questions, and they'll say, "What?" Well, they'll have three or five answers, right? Most of the time they have five, but let's say they have three answers, right? Any kind of survey, they'll say, "Agree, uh, uh, disagree, neither agree or disagree." It's asking you, is your valence, do you agree or disagree? Disagree would mean here that it's false. It doesn't mean that you just don't accept. It means that you think that it's wrong. Or you have no position either way. Do you, do you agree with this? Do you disagree with it, saying that it's wrong? Or do you have no position either way? That'd be, that'd be equivalent to atheist, theist, and, of course, agnostic. No position either way. And, of course, in, in some of the other methodologies, they take it to one extent further to detect the strength of your convictions. One to five. One would be strongly agree, two would be moder you know, moderately agree, three would be no opinion or neutral, four would be disagree, uh, moderately disagree, five would be strongly disagree. Again, testing valence versus strength. This is how the methodology was done with this paper. But <clears throat> as of right now, she's, she's you know, mixing agnosticism and atheism from some strange reason to juxtapose them, but she at least says here that atheism is the belief that God does not exist, and she's using it that way. Okay, that's good. I believe then none of them exist. I go about my day-to-day -day life assuming that I'm not going to be supernaturally gifted commandments etched into stone tablets or impaled by a unicorn. With that in mind, we can separate people into four broad categories based on knowledge versus belief. No, we, no, we can't. Um, I'm not going to get into the specificities of this particular diagram. Why? Because I have so many videos on it already. If you want to go check out my blogs in the video description, I go over it ad nauseum why this is complete nonsense. You're never going to find this in any kind of philosophical literature. It just doesn't exist. Um, it may be talked about in passing. It, some, uh, some have argued it might be nice to have something like this, but that's it. And it just it doesn't work. It doesn't work logically. Um, again, read my, read my essay, uh, Gumballs and God, or um, more specifically relating to this, read uh, The Logical Ambiguity of, of Agnostic Atheists. And I point out very clearly, logically, this just doesn't work. Uh, and if you, if, if you guys could see right off the bat, though, um, the problem with this diagram, without even getting into the specificities of it, um, see if you guys can figure out an issue with it, just on the x-axis alone, okay? So the x-axis is going horizontal, um, and the perpendicular axis, which is orthogonal, is going this way, right, the y-axis. So look on the x-axis real quick. And tell me, I'll give you a few seconds here, because I, I, I forgot to put a, a reference in the... Uh, the Video description, so I want to do that now before I forget. Um, but, but can you see, real, kind of real quick, a potential problem on the x-axis? Now, you have to remember, um, if you're going to do a multi-axial approach to knowledge and atheism, you have to include basically all types of situations, right? If not, it's incomplete. What is what, what's missing from this? 
I try to word it. What, what's missing on the x-axis for, for a specific group that may not apply to both? So see if you can figure that out real, real, real quick. Do, 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 do. Because you remember, there, this is dealing with a different proposition altogether, right? The proposition does, you know, proposition God exists is either God exists or God does not exist. Why you would bring in a different proposition, let was call it Q, is God knowable? Can you know about God? Why would you bring that in? Why does it matter? There's a different domain of discourse. That's the epistemological domain of discourse. Why? Who cares whether you can know whether God exists or not? And now, it does follow that agnostics who believe neither, or, you know, believe they, they're not justified to have a position. They neither believe God exists nor believes God does not exist. They're neither atheist nor theist. That's the whole point of agnostic. They're neither. Why would you want to, to label yourself agnostic when, or something atheist if you don't have a position either way? Because that's the position. You don't have a position either way. You literally believe that you're just not justified to have a position either way and you suspend judgment on it. But now you've brought in another proposition. You're not brought, and that proposition is God knowable, which could be true or false, right? But belief on that could be what? It could be you believe there, there's no God, or excuse me, you believe that uh, you can't know, or you believe there, there can know, but there's also a third position with that too, which would be agnostic on that particular proposition, which means that you have no position on if God's knowable or not. Right? So you don't, it's neither you can't know or, or can know. It's, oh, well, I, I have no position on the knowability of God. Well, assume. If I, so, I mean, okay, I don't believe, right? Because I'm a non-believer. I'm agnostic. So all agnostics don't believe. But not all agnostics make a statement about the knowability of God. Some do. Some say gods are knowable. Some say gods are not knowable. But, some, and, but what about the agnostic that has no position either way on that? What do you call them? You call them agnostic, right? Because that's what it means. It's undecided in, 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 this, in this type of uh, discussions. It means that you literally don't have a position either way. That's how, that's how the term agnostic is used. So, so you're agnostic on the position of, of God knowability. So what are, what are you, agnostic, agnostic, atheist? I mean, it's just, it's just, it just gets into it's just complete absurdities when people start juxtaposing this type of stuff and trying to make these weird diagrams that don't exist anywhere. I mean, it's, it's puerile. It's just absolutely nonsense. Agnostic atheists like me who think we can't know for sure whether or not there's a God, but who believe there's not enough evidence for one. There's Gnostic atheists who think we can know for sure whether or not there's a God and who believe there isn't one. Agnostic theists who think we can't know for sure, but believe there is a God. And Gnostic theists who think we can know and believe there is one. All right. So why does it have to do with like can't be sure or certain? This is another thing that's confusing about the whole Gnostic atheist thing. Some people say, oh, well, Gnostic theists would be somebody who claims they're, they know there's a God, which means I mean, that would entail that you can know, right? Obviously, if you claim knowledge of something, yeah, you have to, to be epistemically consistent, claim that they're knowable, right? It would be incoherent and inconsistent to say, well, I know there's a God, but gods are unknowable, right? But some also say Gnostic theists would be somebody who's certain there's a God. Again, there's no rigor to any of this because it's whatever the hell you want it to be. Go look at these diagrams. There's so many different diagrams of this, and they all say different things. Some say Gnostic theists is somebody who's certain there's a God. Some say there's somebody who believes there's a God and knows there's a God. Some just say that you can know. But what about somebody who claims they believe there's a God and that you can know there's a God, but doesn't claim knowledge themselves? Where do they fall on here? Right? It's just, it's just, this is just abject nonsense, these diagrams. And, and I'm telling you, more and more people have reasoned, reasoned this themselves. They've read my work. They've read other people's work. They read, uh, if you want to go check out Answers and Reason, go check out those guys. Um, Talk, you know, with, with Trolley Dave and Joe. Um, these guys know their know their stuff. They're really good at this. Um, yes, they glibbed a lot from my work, um, and I'm and I respect them for that very much. So, and they give me uh, you know attrib attribution for it. Um, but they know their stuff. You know, God, I've been doing this a very long time. Uh, almost uh, most people in the in the philosophical community online, when they start talking about agnostic atheists, most of it comes from my stuff. I, I really seriously, matter of fact, um, Ozzy has a really good. A video on agnostic atheism uh, talking about, you know, when Matt Dillahunty finally came out and said, look, he found, feels that agnostic atheist, or excuse me, agnostic atheist uh, doesn't make much sense, in, at least in the, in the weak sense. And he's absolutely right. Um, and Ozzy, you know, you know attributed uh, 
some something some you know uh, of the talks to me in his video description and i don't know if matt you know finally came to the conclusion based upon my work not directly but i but i do think through other people uh, there was a heavily uh have a heavy influence on that because um you know he espouses the same things that i've been saying for quite some time now that agnostic atheist doesn't make much sense all right so continue on uh, Kimamaki says, your logic is irrefutable. I'm done with dope. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm hoping my logic is irrefutable. It's logic, right? And it, But if the thing with logic, if it's objectively the case, people can show that the logic is wrong if it's wrong, right? It's up for revision. It's up for review. Nobody ever has. It would be interesting, I think, to examine the personality differences between each of these quadrants, particularly the Gnostics in general versus the agnostics. Do Gnostics have more rigidity in their beliefs compared to agnostics? Are they more emotionally stable? Are they more or less open-minded? Are they more or less anxious? That would be interesting, uh, but that's not what this new study is about. Uh, in being agnostic, not atheist, personality, cognitive, and ideological differences, psychologists asked 600 Belgians how they self-identified, atheist, agnostic, or Christian. Anyone who said they were anything other than those three categories were discarded, which left 550 people. They then gave those people a questionnaire to determine why do many religious non-believers self-identify as agnostics instead of atheists. As okay. okay, so let me rewind that for a second. Okay, so yes, and that, that what she said is true. By the way, if that's too fast for you, let me know. I'll slow it down, but uh, if not, you know how long these things take for me. She's exactly right on that. Uh, they did ask Belgium, which is a very um, secular country. Um, I looked it up, and almost 30% of the population uh, is, is irreligious or non-believers, which is a pretty high percentage because um, in most places, probably they, they don't, they don't um, rate that high. But it asks the question in the abstract, uh, and I have the paper itself in the video description, which I noticed she didn't put in her video. But uh, they ask, you know, why do several non-religious people self-identify as agnostic and not atheist? They're not asking about specifically about labeling. They're not asking, why do you prefer the label of agnostic or label of atheist? They're asking, why do you... Um, preferred to take atheist as the, you know, saying that you believe there's no gods as opposed to being undecided. And if you are undecided on this particular issue, what are the um, epistemological differences? What are the psychological differences between the person who claims there are no gods, the atheist, as opposed to somebody who has no position either way? This is what the paper was reviewing or studying. They wanted to know personality traits, psychological personality traits specifically, about these categories between the atheist and theist. And so this is why they discarded anybody who didn't answer theist, atheist, or agnostic. It discarded theological non-cognitivist. It discarded ichthyist. Why? Because they weren't doing the study on that. They want to know the personality traits that you tend to, they would hypothesize, if you are undecided as opposed to have a conscious decision or you know some kind of, of belief that there is no God. This is what this paper was about. It wasn't why they. Why do you prefer to label yourself with that? That again, she's doing an eisegesis on it. She's putting what she wanted the paper to be, rather than what the paper was about, which I think is dishonest in some ways. Um, you know, and I don't think she did it deliberately. I, I, I don't. I don't think Rebecca did it deliberately. Um, but I do think it was definitely intellectually dishonest to to want the paper to be what you wanted to be about, rather than and, and evaluate it from that, rather than what the paper was actually about instead of atheists. As described, I think a study like that would also be interesting because, as I said, many people, even most people maybe, don't necessarily know the difference between atheist and agnostic, and that includes people who self-identify with those labels. And promisingly, this paper opens with the pointed question, why do many religious non-believers self-identify as agnostics instead of atheists? Unfortunately, they go on to answer answer that question by exclusively examining the differences in personality between those two groups. Because, because that's what the paper was about! I, I, I had to listen to that part a few times ago. Yes, because because that's what the whole purpose of the paper was. Literally to determine those, those personality traits. <laughs> I'm like, did you, did you miss the entire crux of the paper? This, let, me, let, me, let me replay that. Unfortunately, they go on to answer that question by exclusively examining the differences in personality between those two groups. Because that's what the paper was about. Why would that, why would that be unfortunate? That's what they wanted to know. 
asking them questions to rate uh, their own level of neuroticism, pro or antisocial tendencies, open-mindedness, cognitive abilities, religiosity, and spirituality. I'll skip straight to their findings just for the record. I'll quote directly from the abstract. Compared to atheists, agnostics were more neurotic, but also more pro-socially oriented and spiritual and less dogmatic. Strong self-identification as atheist, but not as agnostic, was positively related to analytic thinking and emotional stability, but also dogmatism. Nevertheless, spiritual inclinations among both agnostics and atheists reflected low dogmatism and high pro-social orientation. And additionally, among agnostics, social and cognitive curiosity. So I read all this and I was just baffled. What oh. are we... <laughs> to the surprise of no one she was baffled yeah because you didn't read the paper as the paper was meant to be read of course you're going to be baffled you're using your own mindset and you're using your own terminology to a paper that didn't use it the way that you wanted to read into it right yes you're correct that the the paper we're looking for these things they want to know about being pro-social they want to know about neuroticism Yes, it did conclude that people that are agnostic were probably more pro-social, meaning that you tended to altruism. You tended to be more um, cooperative in social settings, right? Uh, so pro-social people, by the way, this doesn't mean that, that atheists or theists are antisocial, right? It doesn't mean that. It just means pro-social. They wanted to know um, what, do you, what generally do you expect to find, right? Do we expect agnostics to be generally more relating to cooperative behavior and altruism? As opposed to an atheist who tends to be more dogmatic and saying that there, you know, there's no, there's no God. Uh, do do atheists tend to be more open-minded about the possibility of a spiritual realm and and open-mindedness to the existence of God, as opposed to somebody who's already made the mind up that there's no God? This is what they were trying to determine. Yeah, the, and Kevin Mock says the methodology of the survey is pretty great, and that might be the case. I, again, I didn't, I read the method section. I wasn't too interested in that, but. But, you know, it, 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 it did explain the method section. And so, you know, they just wanted to know, again, the balance and the strength, basically, of a particular positions. And would we expect these types of behaviors to be typical of what we'd find if somebody labels themselves um, atheist over agnostic? That's, again, what they were looking for. And they weren't, they, they weren't really the first paper to do with this. There's one paper by Lindemann that actually kind of talks about it as well. But they wanted to also know... Uh, about cognitive preference, which I think was the most interesting part of that particular paper. Uh, they wanted to, uh, to understand, uh, when it came to co cognitive preferences, where people tend to lie on the different ways people approach problems, right? There's, there's generally, uh, and I and an image I'll get into about the four quadrants of the brain, where they get into um, people tend to either analytical thinking, which is more decision-making, sequential thinking, with how they organize things in their mind, uh, imaging, internal imaging, which is you know how they deal with abstract concepts, and then feelings, um, be dealing with a, uh, the more the uh, uh, empathy and more the, the limbic system of, of, of how, how we end up uh, getting things for our own personal um, emotional well-being, right? How, how we uh, approach problems for reproduction and survival. And so... These, these types of things in the psychological sense, this is why they were looking at this. This is why they wanted to know from a psychological point, which, by the way, I know very little, if anything, about psychology. Okay, so uh, I, that's why I asked somebody, if you know about psychology, you know, come on in. I'll open the, the hangout here because I, I just, I'm not a fan of psychology as far as, like, the study of it. Only, only because I just, I'm not interested. I'm not saying it's not a great field. It's, I'm just personally not interested in it. But I do know enough to at least say that this is what they were trying to, to figure out. They were trying to figure out uh, who's a more analytical thinker, who is a more sequential thinker, who is more apt to answer certain questions, what was called the cognitive reflective chest, which you know I, I'll get into here in a few because I thought it was pretty interesting. So there's a lot of reasons why they wanted to know these questions based upon the answers given if somebody self-identified as atheist versus theist, or some atheist versus agnostic. There you go. We meant to do with this information. In the full paper's discussion, they describe how they believe these results provide indirect evidence to support their hypotheses that being ag agnostic reflects a distinct psychological category, not reducible, for instance, to being a closet atheist. They go on. Yeah, right there. That, and that's critical because a lot of people say, oh, agnostics are just closet atheists, which is just nonsense. Um, I'm not saying that they don't exist. I mean, I would have to put probably maybe uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson possibly as a closet atheist, right? He tends to label himself agnostic, maybe because he just doesn't want the stereotype of atheist because he's a science communicator, right? But that's not what this paper was talking about. The paper didn't give a damn whether you label yourself in some way like agnostic as opposed to atheist because of that reasoning, right? Or if there's some kind of stigma by the term atheist, which by the way, 
I find to be very, 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 very marginal. The people that, that identify as agnostic because they don't want the stigma of atheist, you, know, you might only find that in some other country, right? Where, where yes, or, or the deep south where saying you're an atheist is more stigmatized. But other than that, mainstream for the average atheist, nah, that's just nonsense. Um, I get that all the time. Oh, Steve, you're agnostic because you don't want to label yourself atheist. Why would I care? Why would I care to label somebody if I felt that I had that position? I would label myself atheist. I don't care what people think. People should know me by now. I mean, they're like, oh, you just want to, you know, be be you be thought of as an atheist because of the stigma. That's like, dude, I listen to satanic music. I have a show called The Devil's Chat. I wear an, uh, an upside down cross as a symbol for the the band that I like, Ghost. I don't give a shit. It doesn't bother me. But that's not my philosophical position to be an atheist. That's why I don't take the label. So it's not that that. People are going around labeling themselves something they're not out of out of fear of what the ramifications would be if they label themselves that. I mean, again, can happen some places. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's rare, right? But I think a lot more probably people label themselves atheists because they don't want to label somebody agnostic, even though they're not atheist in the philosophical sense. They're they're just somebody who doesn't have a belief either way, which is agnostic, but they choose to label themselves atheist. Okay. You can do that. I, I personally don't get it, but whatever. Just don't apply that to other people. Don't take your reasoning by how you want to label something and apply it to other people. I do not believe in God. That does not by necessity make me an atheist. Anybody who says otherwise knows nothing about these topics. Absolutely nothing. This is the entire atheist community on the side over at the Atheist Experience, Atheist Republic, Atheist uh, uh American atheists, they're all absolutely ignorant when it comes to atheism. Now, you have other groups out there that promote atheism in a very different way. They recognize that people do use the term differently. It is polysemous. But the other groups out there, they don't recognize that. Or at least they say they'll recognize it in the fact that, oh, yeah, the philosophical people do it. But as R.N. Rod would say, oh, that's been influenced by Christians. Christians have have invaded the, the philosophies uh, and, the, and the philosophical realms, and they're the ones that just change the meaning of the word atheist from somebody who doesn't believe to, oh, a positive uh, belief that there's no gods. That's nonsense. There's no evidence for that at all. Zero. Uh, you know, for somebody who claims to be evidential uh, and you ask, you know, aren't for evidence of these things, he never provides it. Yeah, it's a little bit telling, right? In fact, go, I didn't include it, but go, if you do go to my blog, there's an entry by Josiah Hansen. Um, about the historical usage of the term atheist based upon um, a book called Battling of the Gods. And uh, it's very, very enlightening. It, it really is about the usage of the term atheist. And it's just incongruent with the message that most American atheists are putting out. So, but, it, but again, they wanted to make it very clear that agnostics are not just closet atheists. They're a, a very separate group of people. They're not atheists. If you say agnostics or atheists, I'm sorry, but I'm going to put you as philosophically naive. Okay, now, I know there's some educated people that do that, but whatever. Most of them are not philosophers. As a matter of fact, I don't know any of them that are philosophers, to be honest with you. They're all some other discipline. But to me, it's dishonest. It subsumes and sublates uh, agnostic into atheism when, if you go read Dr. Graham Oppie, Dr. Oppie makes it very clear that agnosticism is no more closer to theism than it is to atheism, or no more closer to atheism than it is to theism. It is neither theist nor atheist. On to say, non-believers who prefer to self-identify as agnostic and not as atheist may be, one, more anxious and hesitant about the best answer to give to the fundamental existential questions, two, more interested in and respectful of people from opposite sides and their unbeliefs and values, three, less certain and more flexible regarding their own beliefs and worldviews, and or four, more religiously socialized and today more valuing non-religious spirituality. Yeah, and I think that's true. Um, and again, I, I know it's, it's going over real fast, but you guys can keep up. Um, I do think that. Okay, so there's an umbrella, umbrella group that's called the non-believers, and there's an umbrella group called the believers. This is just a, a basic set theory, right? For for a, a complementary set, you have A and not A. So you have belief believers, and anybody who's not a believer is in the set of non-believers, and then those two sets combined form the universal set. So in set theory, you have a universal set. In that universal set, you have A and not A which is a part of you. They are complementary sets. They are mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive. In other words, you cannot be both in the set of non-believers and the set of believers. That would be a contradiction. 
So non-believers is the umbrella set, not atheist. Atheist is not the umbrella. It's not theist versus atheist. It's theist versus not theist. Atheist versus not atheist. Believers versus not believers. Right? This is A or not A, and you instantiate A because the law of negation is A or not A is um, true. It's defined to be true, actually. It's, it's, it's even stronger than an equality. It's, it's a tautology, right? So A or not A, the ta tautologically, is always going to be true. So if you instantiate A with anything, car versus not car, right? Believers versus not believers. Theist versus not theist. In order to get to theist versus not theist, you would have to instantiate A and not A with two different semantic terms, right? And that, to me, is dishonest because what you're doing is a semantic substitution. One, it leads to semantic collapse, which I've, I've, I think I've demonstrated pretty clearly in my paper on the, how the presumption of atheism by way of semantic square of opposition leads to semantic collapse in the video description if you want to read it. Very popular paper. It has like 750 views, uh, reads already. Pretty popular paper on academic EDU. Um, I actually sent it to one of my bosses. He, he's in the philosophy and he wanted, in, in logic and he wanted to read it. Um, so uh, I think I pretty well established that it leads to some kind of epi, uh, some, uh, semantic collapse. But it's dishonest to instantiate A and not A with two different things. If I say A or not A, dog or cat, what? That's not A or not A. You've just violated your own, you know, the, the tautology there because, because even, even, even if you mean dog or cat and you want cat to mean dog, now you're just playing semantic games with words. I could say, okay, um, A or not A, uh, car or automobile or coche. In Spanish, car is coche or automobile. So if I say car or not coche, okay, semantically that means car or not car. But unfortunately, that's a semantic thing. It's this, but the, the, the actual reference is, is, is not the same as the symbol. And so to say A or not A, you want to keep the same symbology, right? You want to keep uh, dog or not dog, cat or not cat. You don't want to say cat or not got, though. Does that make sense? Because, again, now you're just using a different language to describe it. But, but unfortunately, even, even, in, even to me... If you're going to talk about a tautology in logic to avoid uh, ambiguities and avoid equivocation, you want to keep the exact same thing. You want to instantiate it, the A, with the same thing. So if you have car, you want not car. Does that make sense? So, so, so the umbrella is non-believers. And so number one says more anxious and hesitant about the best answer to give to fundamental existential questions. In other words, uh, yeah, you would expect agnostics to be more undecided. Go figure. Right? I mean, that, that, that to me is a, is a good hypothesis. Oh, you're undecided on the aspects of God. Are you undecided on other spiritual things? Yeah. Now, there's certain things I have decided. I believe that um, uh, things like hell doesn't exist. You know, I believe that. It's not just a matter of agnostic on it. I believe there is no hell, at least in the way that the, it's described in the Bible. The, you know, the conscious eternal damnation. To me, that is incongruent with a benevolent being. So... I think that that particular thing just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but you would find that maybe uh, agnostics are going to be tend to be more open-minded toward things of the existence of God and spirituality. Again, I don't think that's that far of a leap to have that high kind of hypothesis. Now, it doesn't mean that it is some kind of written law that if you're, you're an agnostic, <clears throat> or excuse me, if you're an atheist, that you are not open-minded, that there may be a God, right? I mean, some, some atheists say, look, yeah, there's a possibility God exists which I think is, is virtuous. And virtuous virtue epistemology, open-mindedness, is a virtue. And I think for atheists to acknowledge that there might be a God is, is beneficial. For the, guy, for the atheists to say there cannot possibly be a God, <clears throat> that's a hell of an argument to make. And I only really know of very few atheists that make that argument. One of them is Arn Raw, and his argument is straight-up dumb. I don't know how else to say it. It's straight-up stupid. And what he said was that there is no God. God cannot exist. God is impossible by definition. Yeah, at that point, you've just, you've just relegated yourself to just non-importance in these types of topics to say something so incredibly stupid. You can't just define God out of existence. It, it just, it, if it was that simple, why would be there so many you know, theists out there? No, that's just stupid. 
All right, so number two. More interested in or res and respect for people of opposite size and their, of their unbeliefs and, and values. I think that's true. Again, as an agnostic, I have a lot of people on the non sequitur show that are theist and atheist, right? I get a balance of, of, of you know, positions. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I have some name recognition in both the theist and the atheist community because I'm not dogmatic. In fact, this paper uh, tends to, to, to found out that atheists tend to be more dogmatic than agnostic. Yeah, I would think that would be suspected, you know, to be the case. Right, they had hypothesized this, found out that was kind of the, the case. People says, did you notice how she expanded on her ideas about the terms, but doesn't say how they, they were used in the study? Oh, we'll get to that. I have the paper. I will definitely show you that. Um, three, less certain and more flexible regarding their own beliefs and view world views. In other words, um, they find that agnostics are more open to self-revision, more flexible in changing and revising their belief box. I think, that's, I think that makes sense. And we do tend to be less certain of things. I agree. I only claim certainty on very, very, very small things, uh, types of uh, knowledge, like a priori knowledge. Like I am certain that for all of X, X equals X. Why? Because I can't be wrong on that. I'm certain on it. I have certitude, which means I have no doubt. Right? I have absolute surety. Why? Because that is necessary in all possible worlds. Now, this, for example, somebody says, well, what happens if it isn't the case that? Well, then, I mean, that just means I had a claim of certainty, claim of knowledge that I got wrong, right? But I am claiming I am certain, right? I am claiming that I have certainty that for all of X, X equals X. If for some bizarre reason, hypothetically speaking, which will never happen, um, that all the logic is wrong, then I'll say, okay, I retract that claim to knowledge. Again, I wrote an essay called Principle of Attribution and Retraction. Which I didn't put in the video description, but you're going to find it on my blog. I, I, my, I have enough links in the blog, but, but go read the principle of attribution and retraction. I explain that beliefs, we, we, don't, we don't retract beliefs, right? If I say I believe it's going to rain tomorrow and it doesn't rain tomorrow, I don't say tomorrow, oh, I, had a, I, I, I retract the claim of belief. No, I have the belief. It was a false belief, right? But I had the belief yesterday. My belief has been revised. It has changed today that I now believe it's not going to rain today. Why? Because it didn't rain. Right? Or it's not going to rain. But if I say, yeah, I know it's going to rain tomorrow, and tomorrow comes and it doesn't rain, I don't say I had false knowledge. Why? Because knowledge is true. And in this case, it is by definition of justified true belief. That is prescriptive. Right? Because it, it details what it means to be knowledge. It has very specific uh, criteria to be knowledge. It is prescribed. It's not described. And so... Uh, what we say is I retract the claim of knowledge. I, I take it back. I say, you know what? I no longer claim I had knowledge. This is called the principle of attribution and retraction. And I believe that was Ozzy that kind of coined that phrase. But when I did that blog, I based upon what Ozzy was talking about. Um, but uh, I think that, that agnostics are generally more uh, going to be people that want to revise their beliefs frequently, actually, especially when it comes to the more prominent existential questions. Uh, and four, more religiosity socialized today, uh, more valuing non-religious spirituality. And I think that's quite true, too. Uh, I think that agnostics probably will be more attending to some kind of spirituality, uh, not in the supernatural sense, but in awe and wonder. Uh, that doesn't mean that atheists can't, right? It, it's, again, these are just tendencies. It may not be vast tendencies, just, just minute. But I think that, you know, agnostics, as myself, I am fine with saying when I hear a wonderful piece of music, it has spiritual stirrings. That's how I use the, the term spirituality, right? Spirituality does not necessi necessitate supernaturalism. All right, so let's go on here. The latter possibility allows agnostics not to throw the baby spirituality out with the bathwater religion. Finally, Agreed. high analytic thinkers may turn out to self-identify strongly as atheists, but not necessarily as agnostics. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, um, let, me, let me go over that again real quick. This may turn out to self-identify strongly as atheists, but not necessarily as agnostics. So high analytical thinkers may turn out to be self-identifying strongly as atheists, but not necessarily as agnostic. Right. Because <clears throat> there can be the, uh, it, the, when it came to these analytical, okay, so let me kind of back up here. There was a, a, a paper a long time ago. It was on, called, it was on analytical atheism. And one of the people that came, uh, wrote it was named Bill Gervais. He's mentioned in this paper, and we'll get into that. But Bill Gervais is a clinical psychologist. He's not a philosopher. And it's not Rick Gervais. So if you're reading this paper and you see the name Gervais, they're not talking about Ricky Gervais. They're talking about William Gervais. And when it talked about analytical atheism, which I'm going to get into 
my presentation here in a, in a few. Uh, I found out to be the most interesting thing in this paper because the analytical, uh, they want to know, are analytical thinkers less religious than people who follow intuition, their gut instinct, right? So this was analytical thinking versus emotional thinking. Do people tend to, who claim to be analytical thinkers, do they tend to be less religious because they want to, to go with analytics rather than just gut feelings? That's, that's what they wanted to know. And of course, they wanted to take this and go one step further and ask about scientists. Well, if you're a scientist and you believe in the scientific method and you're an analytical person, do you tend to more analytical atheism that you tend to, to go with um, a very stringent way of looking at a problem rather than your, your gun intuition? There's nothing, and there's nothing wrong with gun intuitions, by the way. Nothing wrong with them. But when it comes to religiosity, they wanted to, to know, do people tend to go with their gut or do they actually come to the conclusion there's no God through some kind of analytical reasoning? And I think this is an important question to ask. I, I really do. Gnostics. Wow, fascinating. So much indirect evidence for these hypotheses that still remain open. If only there are a way to gather direct evidence to confirm or refute them, like... Well, well, well that's what they did. They had direct evidence by their asking the people about their labeling and then the personality traits that they would expect to find by using a scale from you know one to five of strongly agree or disagree again asking about their beliefs do you believe this is true do you believe this is false you have no opinion either way if you ask the question does god exist you have the, the balance of believe god exists believe god does not exist the positive the negative and you also have the strength of that conviction do you strongly believe there's no God? Do you strongly believe there is a God? Or you just, yeah, I believe there's a God, but yeah, not very strongly. I, I believe there isn't a God. Eh, not very strongly. There's a magnitude to be had there. That's what the paper did. So yes, it, it was very informative on that. This is where she goes into full ice of Jesus mode, though. I don't know, maybe by, uh, oh, asking atheists and agnostics why they identify the way they do. That's Which is... <clears throat> oh, God. Tell me now, somebody. Okay. <clears throat> They did ask them why they identified. It was based upon the belief that God does not exist. Right? This again, it wasn't about why you picked a particular label. Why do, you, why do you just call yourself this? Right? She says, well, just ask the person. Okay. And by the way, I did respond to her video in the comment section. I didn't ask her, you know, like I said, I even asked her if she wanted to join. Okay, so if you ask me, why do I take the label of agnostic? Well, because I hold the position that I'm not justified to have a conclusion to believe there's a God or believe there's not a God, and I suspend judgment on it. I neither believe there's a God, nor do I believe there's not a God. I'm neither atheist nor agnostic. That's why I take the label of atheist, agnostic. I'm neither atheist nor theist. That's why I take the label of agnostic. Because in the philosophical terminology, who is somebody who's undecided on a proposition? An agnostic. Simple as that. It's not complicated. Why do, you take the, why do you take the label in philosophy? If you ask a person in philosophy why they take the label of something, it's usually because they hold that position. Right? Why do you take the label of a, uh, a theist? Well, because I believe there's a God. Not me personally, but I mean for somebody who's a theist. If you ask, a, Go ask a theist. Hey, uh, are you a theist? Yeah. Why do you take that label? Because I believe there's a God? Well, yeah. What's the understanding of believe, somebody who believes there's a God? A theist! <laughs> What's the understanding of somebody who believes there's no God? An atheist. Why complicate it beyond that? You could do that. Look, I understand like sometimes you can't just straight up ask someone a question in psychological research and get the unvarnished truth. But in many cases, it can be surprisingly effective. For instance, when you're in a highly secularized country like Belgium, where there's not a lot of reasons why a person would lie to a researcher asking them anonymous questions about why they consider themselves atheist instead of agnostic. True. Here's how I would personally design a survey to puzzle out the answers to oh, their hypotheses. I'd ask people to define what they think atheist means and what they think agnostic means. Oh, 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 why? Well, at that point, you're just playing semantics. Oh, I self-identify as a, as a, um, you know, I hate to say it, but attack helicopter, like somebody would say, right? When, you know, um, when we talk about the gender stuff, people would way back when, if you remember, they're talking about gender. They're like, oh, I identify as attack helicopter to try to parody people that are identifying um, different ways as far as gender, conform gender conformity. Why do you identify attack helicopter? Well, I, I, you know, I define my gender as that. But we're not asking people on, the, they were not asking people in the survey, and I'm not asking people why they pick a particular label most of the time. Um, because they just like the, 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 the phrase or the term, right? 
Now, sometimes I am like agnostic atheist. Yeah, I want to know why the hell you, you call yourself agnostic atheist because I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. But the paper wanted to know why people would label themselves agnostic or atheist because of the positions they had, not what they wanted to find these words to mean. Who does that in a research paper? Who goes and says, hey, I want to do, do a study, but you, you get to define the terms. What? That makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Now, there might be reasons to ask particular questions. But, okay, well, why do you call yourself an atheist where, you know, you have no belief either way, but that's called agnostic in philosophy? Why don't you just call yourself an agnostic? Why do you particularly want to label yourself an atheist? Now, there are some actually good answers to that or reasonable answers. I don't think they're good, per se, but reasonable. One of the answers I do get from more of the intelligent atheists out there who do do that will say, well, yes, I recognize that you're right on this, Steve, and atheism is, the you know, generally thought of as a belief that God does not exist. And yes, in the philosophical sense, I'd be an agnostic, but I'd call myself an atheist to more you know, conform with social, um, uh, you know, social conformities with the people that I talk to. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. I get it. It's not, it's not incoherent. <clears throat> I, I wouldn't do it myself. But at least it's not unreasonable. Right? And, Rus and Bertrand Russell had a paper on this called Am I Agnostic or an Atheist? And he, and he basically argued the same thing. You know, am I an atheist or agnostic? Well, it depends on who I'm talking to. <clears throat> you know, and generally speaking, um, I think Bertrand Russell was probably an atheist in a philosophical sense. But, you know, and for the most part, he generally advocated uh, non-belief, uh, not specifically there's no God. So he would just call himself an agnostic. But, you know, the different types of people, he would call himself an atheist. But he would actually get into more local atheism versus global atheism. It wasn't more so much the position of no gods. It's just he believed that uh, he would be an atheist in certain countries where you didn't believe that particular god, right? That's called local atheism. So he wasn't talking about global atheism. He doesn't, I don't read anything in Bertrand Russell specifically where he's saying, look, there are no gods. He may have at some point, I, so I've missed it in his writings. But he basically took more of an agnostic point of view, um, but did admit that he'd be a local atheist to certain types of gods. Okay, well, me too. There's, I believe certain gods don't exist. Okay, I believe Thor doesn't exist. I believe that, that um, Loki doesn't exist. I believe that uh, Odin doesn't exist. Uh, okay, doesn't make me an atheist, though. We're talking about... Atheism in the global sense, when we're talking about these types of studies, it wants to know um, about generally if there's any gods. Now, some of these papers do say mainly the Christian God. I get that, right? They they they're doing the study specifically toward the Christian God. Why? Because it's probably there's more there's more or, or at least the the Abrahamic God. Why? Because most people that are theists probably going to tend to the Abrahamic religions, right? The Christianity, Islam, or Judaism. Those are the, the big ones. And so when they're doing a paper and they want to know about people's beliefs, they tend to center themselves on that particular God rather than the no gods. Okay, I get that. Right. I would ask for their honest opinion on whether or not they believe in a God and on whether or not they think it's possible to be certain there is or isn't a God. Okay. Why would you care if, they're, if about whether they're certain or it's possible God exists or not? Sure, those are great questions. But it's irrelevant to the question, does God exist? You know, I mean... Yeah, but I, I, I'm interested if you think that you're certain there's no God, why? And if you have an, a, a, an argument like aren't raw, oh, I'm certain there's no God because gods are impossible by definition. Yeah, you're just, you're just not worth talking to, right? So yeah, I would like to know in that sense if you have such a dumb argument like that, whether you understand these particular concepts. But other than that, I'm not really going out in these discussions with people wanting to know the strength of their conviction that much. Right? I just want to know whether they believe a God or believe there's no God. I, I really don't really care so much whether the strength of their convictions are going to be of that of, of, of the reach, the level of knowledge or of certainty. Right? And this paper wasn't interested in that as well. It wasn't really interested that much in the, uh, in, in the, the magnitude. So it, it was only because it wanted to know, based upon the magnitude of the answers, the, if the likelihood of the hypothesis, whether agnostics or atheists are going to tend to these very specific uh, philosophical positions, right? Or philosophical attributes, I should say, right? Relating to being analytical thinkers, relating to neuroticism, relating to open-mindedness. Yeah. So if you were a strong agnostic, you would probably qualitatively sp speaking say that the agnostic who self-identifies as agnostic as I just don't have a belief the other way. And I say very strongly hold that, you know, because I just 
say you're, you're 50 50 agnostic, which I don't think exists, but let's say hypothetically it does, then yeah, you're probably going to have more um, towards being uh, indecisive or more being neurotic, more being open minded, which is fine. Um, as opposed to somebody where, yeah, I'm agnostic, but I tend more toward the non-belief, which is perfectly fine as well. You might be a little less open-minded, which is just makes sense, right? As, as when, you, when you start going to the, the, the level of, of convictions that you have, you're going to probably tend to be less open-minded. It's just a natural byproduct. If I say I'm certain there's no God, I'm not very open-minded that there's a God, right? If I say I'm certain that... A equals A, or for all of X, X equals X. Yeah, my open-mindedness is pretty nil that you're going to convince me otherwise. Because these are, by, you know, by analytical fact, by a priori knowledge, to be true and necessary and true in all possible worlds. So you have a hell of a bar to, to overcome if you think you're going to disprove A equals A. I know one atheist who's tried, John Richards, from, who used to be with the Atheist Alliance International. But he's an idiot, uh, and he has a temporal component, and everybody who's ever listened to him tried to explain how ontologically speaking, A does not equal A, has lost their minds. They have never been the same, because it's just, it's complete babble. It's nonsensical from start to finish. But it just makes sense that the strength of the conviction, based upon the survey of how you, you, you hold your belief, um, would be relevant to things like open-mindedness. That's all. You know, and Christopher Green, by the way, welcome, Christopher. Um, he says, I call myself an atheist because I believe the proposition, positive proposition, that there are no gods, which, which is what people would answer. That's, that. yes. If you believe there's no God, what are you going to call yourself other than an atheist? I like to know. If somebody says, I believe there's no gods, okay, what do you label yourself? Well, I label myself a theist. Why? Oh, because I define theist to be somebody who believes there's no gods. Okay, that's what she's saying. She's allowing the person to define these things for themselves, which you can do, but it doesn't make much sense to do that. If I told you, yeah, I, I'm a theist, and you say, oh, so you believe there's God. No, 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 I define theism to be somebody who lacks a belief there's a God. Which, by the way, isn't logically incoherent. That's weak theism. Um, so by, by uh, logic, I'm a weak theist because I'm agnostic, and I'm also a weak atheist. I have proven logically, actually prove it using logic, by using uh, uh, modus ponens. Uh, no, I use modus, did I use modus ponens for that? Anyways, but I, I proved it um, using, uh, using logic that all weak atheists are also weak theists or they're also agnostics. These are synonymous terms. If you have no positive epistemic status and you claim to have no position either way, you are, in philo the philosophical sense, an agnostic, but you're also a weak theist, and you're also a weak atheist. You're all three of those things. This is proven. You go look at the logic. If you think you defute the logic, go ahead. But nobody's been able to do so so far. But she's saying, hey, so why do you take this? She wants to know why you take this particular label, which is fascinating into itself, but it was not the point of the paper. Yes, I'd be interested. If Christopher Green says, I call myself a theist because I believe this proposition that there are no gods, I'm going to question that. I'm going to be like, well, why do you want to call yourself a theist? Because that's confusing because theist is understood as somebody who believes there's a god, right? Christopher Green says, however, these are beliefs. Beliefs are propositional. Yeah, most beliefs, right? I mean, when we're talking about these types of beliefs, these are propositional beliefs, right? Propositions can be true or false. Yes, these are beliefs that are truth apt. They can either be truth or false. Uh, atheism in the weak case, the the... Um, lack of belief it cannot be propositional. It is psychological. And the problem with that is you can, never, you can never say atheism is true then, which seems to me incongruent with what atheists are trying to do. If they want to promote atheism, why would you not want to be able to say atheism is true? Because if you're saying theism is false, you are saying atheism is true because they are opposites of each other. They're actually what's called contradictories of each other, meaning that if atheism is true, theism is false. Think about that. They are mutually exclusive such that if atheism is true, if there's a God, right? Or me, if there's not a God, then atheism is true, meaning that the belief that you have is correct. You, you've got it right, right? You are, your belief comports with reality if there's no God. Theist, if there is a God, they got it right. So theism and atheism 
are contradictories. They both can't be true at the same time. Right? God can either exist or God does not exist. So they both can't be right. One of them is wrong. But they both um, also uh, can't be false. One of them has to be true. Right? That's why they call contradictories. Because one of them got it right. The atheist got it right or the theist got it right. Or you have like myself who's agnostic who's neither. I don't take a position. So I, I'm not saying, I'm not taking a stance on it. Right? Does that make sense? You guys get that? That is that atheism and agnostic are contradictories. Now, you, you also find that the beliefs would be contraries too. And, and um, on my on, on my particular paper, I'm treating them as, as contraries as opposed to subcontraries, um, and as opposed to contradictions, because the way I use the semantic square of opposition, I'm talking about the beliefs themselves. Um, and so the difference between the belief versus the the um, the, st- the, the atheism and theism as far as being contradictory is as one is true the, and the other is false as opposed to the, the, the person holding that particular belief. Because a contrary belief wouldn't be I believe there's a God as opposed to I do not believe there's a God. That's would be the, con- the, con- the, the con- contradiction. So you have, to, you have to be very careful when you're talking about contraries versus contradictions. On my paper, I'm treating them as contraries. Um, but... That's because I'm talking about the, the belief that somebody has. You either, if you have this belief, then it's true. If you don't have the belief, then you don't have it. If, if you have the belief, that it's false. So I'm not talking about the belief being true or false. I'm talking about atheism and theism being the contraries of if you hold that particular belief or you don't hold that particular belief. That's, that's the distinction to be made. Um, so there's a little bit of confusion there. Maybe I'd give them a little quadrant and they could put a marker where they think their mindset lands. I would compare where they place themselves with how they describe themselves. Are self-described atheists more likely to put their marker in the no belief high certainty quadrant? Are self-described agnostics more likely to put their little marker on the no belief low certainty quadrant? And then I just straight up ask them why they identify as atheists instead of agnostic. And- okay, so so she wants to have she, she wants to do some kind of, uh, again, um, quantitative analysis here where she wants to be able to have some kind of ability you, you put a dawn on here, so you're, you're saying, what's the strength of your conviction, right? So there's qualitative analysis versus quantitative analysis. Quantitative is obviously using numbers and things that you can measure. Qualitative more immeasurable things. Uh, you know, like in retail, you're finding a lot of qualitative analysis. Like why do women tend to purchase certain things with certain colors, right? Why, these tendencies are qualitative. Um, but if, okay, for example, me, okay, I'm, I'm going to put myself... In the don't believe, but I'm going to put myself probably in the middle of these two quadrants on the line, which means I don't exist in any quadrant. Because let's say let's say that I I'm not saying that I, I you can know, and I'm not saying you can't know. So I'm going to be right, right on the zero on the y-axis. I'm going to be let's put, let's put myself at negative negative four on the on the y-axis. Okay, but zero I mean negative four on the y-axis and zero on the x-axis. I'm sorry. So zero on the x-axis. Okay, but negative five on the y axis, or negative four on the, on the on the y axis. So I'm somewhere between quadrant three and four. I'm 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 on that line. I'm on the x axis. So I don't fall into agnostic or gnostic atheist. Again, this this system doesn't work. The scheme that she has does not work. Because for somebody who says, "Well, I, I'm agnostic on the position of God's noble," they're going to fall. Right on that midline, right on the orthogonal line from the x-axis, they're going to fall with you know somewhere on there. Let's say, like I said, negative four. Right, a certain if you have certainty, you, I, what would that even mean? Right, if I have certainty that I'm going to be because these things are not uh, enumerated, they're, they're not um, uh, parameterized. They're not. There's not. There's not any numbering on here. Right, there's no numerization. I have no idea what what the metric would be to say. Okay, I'm on the the very bottom of the y-axis. Well. Obviously, a y-axis extends in, into infinity, right? But here, there's a there's a boundary to it. There's a parameterization to it. So, what would that mean to be at the very bottom of the x-axis on that bottom horizontal line, which is parallel to the x-axis? I, I don't know. I don't know how you would combine this weird trying to to do, to quantify these things on, using these types of labeling, right? I mean, yeah, it's just a it's just a. a, a uh, a generalization, and you see other diagrams do this, especially in politics, whether you tend more to authoritativeness versus, you know, you know, uh, libertarianism. Yeah, I get that, but these are just generalizations. There's not a strong way to quantify these things. 
But if you're if you end up in the in the midline there, okay, that works in some kind of political spectrum. But that's because it's a spectrum. She's not treating this as a spectrum. She's treating it as, oh, you're an agnostic atheist or you're an agnostic atheist. I, well, I, according to this diagram, I'd be neither if that's what she wants. Because I have, uh, you know, I have no position whether you can or cannot know. Well, t- t- I do, I, I, I do tend to think that you probably, I, I think you could argue you can know whether God exists or not, but or the possibility that you can or cannot know. But right now, I, I, was, I was called a zero data agnostic. Uh, would be somebody who says, "Look, right now, I just don't think anybody can be justified to claim knowledge. I don't think I, I doesn't. I'm not, it may be possible one day, right? And I think it probably will be. I think I think maybe let's say like hypothetically, ten thousand years from now, when we develop different theories of knowledge and things of that nature, one could be justified to say, "Look, everybody on the planet believes there's no God, right? They can claim knowledge because it's not a thing any longer. Matter of fact, let's say gods are just forgotten. The whole concepts of gods are forgotten, except for a handful of people." And they're just like, yeah, there are no gods, you know. We know there's not. Okay, well, you might be able to justify it a little bit more strongly in that case, right? The no belief, low certainty quadrant. And then I just straight up ask them why they identify as atheist instead of agnostic and vice versa. Is it because you have a negative view of one of those terms? Is it because the actual definition? Why? Yeah, no, and I get this. People have, can have a negative view of the stereotype of agnostic. Matter of fact, the group that I, I, I kind of promote lately has been the uh, atheist for liberty which wants to get rid of the stigmatization of the term atheist to normalize it. I think that most people um, that are in the atheist and agnostic communities agree with that. But the, the term stig, the stigmatization of atheism is nowhere near what it used to be. It used to be you identify as an atheist, you're not going to get a job, right? They were considered to be um, uh, less ethical than people that tended to identify as Christian or theist. This was normative back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the, the things I had I'd read was that atheists tend to be more altruistic than Christians, but the reason why is because they wanted to make up for that stigmatization. They wanted to make up for the fact that Christians held at one time that atheists were less moral. Now, in the 21st century, in the year 2022, we're finding this to be far less than what it was. Uh, I think the term athe- atheism has been far more normalized. And so... Uh, there might be third world countries where the stigmatization, uh, the term atheism might be more you know, uh, appropriate to take a different label. Why? Because there's safety concerns. Um, or if, you know, if your family hates the term atheist, I get that, but it's rare. But this is not what the paper was studying. This is where I think she makes an absolute fundamental mistake. She is taking her own views of what she wanted the paper to be, in other words, an eisegesis, and not reading the paper for what it was, an exegesis. I think it was a fundamental mistake. ...just uh, doesn't fit with what you believe. And by the time you get all of that information, then personality information can actually be interesting. For instance, atheists... Why is it not interesting now based upon the fact that I wanted to know if you're undecided on something, do you tend to be more open-minded? If you're undecided on, on the, the, the spiritual questions of no ability of, uh, to be the, uh, uh, the question of whether God exists or not, um, do, you, do you have more belief revisionism? Do you are, are you do... Uh, hold to more critical thinking? Do you do hold to more epistemic virtues of open-mindedness and belief revisionism? Right? That's what they wanted to know. As opposed to somebody who says, there is no God, right? Because she believes there is no God, so she asserts there's no God. They tend to be more dogmatic. That's what they wanted to know, which I find to be interesting. Who prefer the uh, term- Lang says, the new definition of atheism absorbs agnostics into the community. Yes, it subsumes and sublates them. Um, thus diminishing the stigma attached to the, the word, which I think is a, is a BS way to do it because it, it basically you're being dishonest to, to try to destigmatize atheism. It's counterproductive. The agnostics out there have pushed back on this in, ha- in for a very long time because they recognize that atheists are being dishonest by doing this. She say, he says, I feel like it's a strategic thing. Absolutely. And they, many of them admit this. If you go read um, Silverman's book, um, uh, Fight Against God, uh, Fighting God, uh, he makes it pretty clear that he's it's it's for political reasons that why the why they want atheists to just assume agnostics. It is strategic. It's for voting power. It's for demographics. This was a whole thing behind new atheism, trying to to, to get more power uh, in order to change things after nine eleven. I think it was dishonest, though. I think it was counterproductive, and I think that if you have to be dishonest to try to label other people to get them 
in your camp in order to make change, um, you're doing going about it the wrong way. Because sure, you can argue from a utility point of excuse me, a, a consequentialist or utility point of view that this may, may end up making more effective change. It's Machiavellian to me. I don't think the ends justify the means in that case because it's a very short-term gain. Because what's happening is that we've noticed the people that were in these atheist communities, many have left religion and many have left the religiosity that they had and they felt that they were lied to. Young Earth creationists felt they were lied to. They felt they were lied to by their pastors and by um, all these years of studying the Bible. And then they go into these religious communities and they're finding out they're being lied to by them as well. New atheism, especially atheist experience, the atheist republic, the American atheist are lying to people. It's not a matter of them not knowing the information. They do. Matt Delahunty is not ignorant of this information. He has chosen to lie to people. Now, Arne is pretty ignorant. I don't, Arne's not lying. Arne's just inept when it comes to philosophy. And again, I like Arne. I really do. Biology is great. Um, and I really wish, you know, we hadn't had a falling out by me correcting him on his philosophies uh, that he was continually getting wrong. But I wasn't the only one, which is weird because he's still friends with people that corrected him the same way I did. But, you know, for some reason, he, he didn't like my approach, which is basically, dude, you're just wrong. And then I finally asked him, well, Arn, if you can't show it, you don't know it, which is his famous catchphrase. And he blocked me after that. Uh, Slang says the anti experience has become very political. Absolutely. Yes. Now, again, uh, people may remember, you know, Rebecca Watson, you know, back, way back from Elevator Gate, and some have coined her the death of atheism. Again, not going to get into all that in this particular episode, but it is a very fascinating story, which one day we might get into uh, in a different episode. But yes, a lot of people contribute, attribute the death of atheism due to Atheism Plus and Elevator Gate term agnostic because they don't like the stereotype of an atheist might be more neurotic than those who prefer the term just because they think it actually better describes them. Maybe people whose self-identification more closely matches their beliefs are also more analytical than people who, for instance, call themselves agnostic simply because they haven't thought too critically about their own beliefs. So yeah, okay, But that makes no sense. Um, I don't call myself an agnostic because I haven't thought critically about my beliefs. I think critically about my beliefs frequently. That's why I have um, come to the conclusion that my self-identification is more apropos um, and more appropriate to be agnostic. Because I find that the people who self-identify as atheist, when they're really philosophically agnostic, are doing so dishonestly. And I want to be honest in my interlocutor with my interlocutors. I don't want to just tell them a position I don't have. Because according to her, we let people define their own positions. Okay. But if again, if I say I'm a theist, um, because I'm defining theism as the position of not believing there isn't a God. Okay, that is weak theism, by the way. But that's the same thing atheists are doing. They're saying, oh, I'm an atheist because I, I don't have the position that there's a God. Well, that's weak atheism. And if you're defining weak atheism to be atheism, then weak theism can be defined to be theism. This is my whole argument before my um, WASP argument, my weak atheist special pleading argument, that if atheists are allowed to do it, theists are allowed to do it. If not, you're special pleading. And so um, you generally don't really want people to define things like that by their own accord if you're asking them about the subject matter in the domain of discourse. So if I ask somebody in philosophy, what is your position? And you say you're, you're um, at a, you know, an atheist, I'm going to take it to be that you hold a position there are no gods because I'm asking you normative usages. If you have an atypical usage, then then you need to address it. And you say, look, um, in philosophy, some people use a, a atheism as mere non-belief. Okay, yeah. Some people use atheism in a philosophy to mean there are no supernatural beings. There is no supernatural realm. They equate it to naturalism. Papers have been written historically. Atheism, where the, the intent of the author was not just there is no God, but there is no supernatural realm. There's nothing non-natural. That's how they use the term atheist. It's atypical, but it's been used that way. I particularly don't because I think that's confusing. Why? Because there's already a term for that. It's called naturalism. So why would you, why would you use a different term, atheist, to describe naturalism? Same reasoning. Why would you term, use the term atheist to describe agnostic? If you're undecided, you have no position either way, why would you call yourself an atheist? I, I don't understand. There's no reason to when we already have a word for that. I think it's just silly to me. But again, some people argue, well, you know, because I want to fit in with the social norms of my caste, of my tribe. Okay, whatever. 
You know, like how can I argue against that, right? They're giving me a reason. It's not incoherent. I think it's silly, and I personally wouldn't do it, but whatever. Yeah, while I think the study could have been interesting, it just ends up being a muddled mess that misses a golden opportunity to actually learn more about how people with a minority belief system, even in Belgium, uh, that exists outside of an organized religion, how those people interrogate their own beliefs and how they then represent those beliefs to... How, how is it a muddled mess? This, I thought the paper was pretty good. Well, again, she's putting her own spin on this. It's not a muddled mess. It, it really makes a lot of sense if you read the paper properly the outside world. Atheism and agnosticism are interesting because they're philosophies that don't have communities and leaders who offer consistent, frequent guidance on how to think about those beliefs. Yeah, yeah they do. Yeah, yeah, yes, Rebecca, they do. Absolutely do. There are many atheist communities who think they are the experts on atheism. I've actually had people tell me atheists are the ones who get to define atheism. That's bullshit. That never has any, in any, any type of, of, of community have words been used to be self-defined for the whole, right? Words are, are organically changed in, in, in community, you know, in, in the whole, in the general parlance. A community can find something for themselves, right? A community can say, hey, we use this word this way in our community. Okay, it's confusing and it's atypical, but... They can only do it for themselves. They cannot define it for other people. You cannot say, I'm an atheist, therefore I get to define atheism for everybody else. No, 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 no. Especially because whenever I have an atheist do that, I'm like, wait a minute here. I got most of my audience are atheists, and I'll tell you right now, they'll, they'll tell you they use atheism as the position there is no God. So they don't get to define atheism for the masses as there's no God, but you do? Why do you get to have special privilege? You're both atheists according to you, as a matter of fact, they fall into atheism because they believe there's no God, which entails they don't believe there is one. It's a logical entailment there. So they get to define atheism as a belief that does not, God does not exist for the masses, and you get to define atheism as a belief or the non-belief of, of God. Who decides what then? It's because it's not how it works. Yeah, kind of like how women can define women or feminists can define feminists. No, you don't get to define words for everybody else. You can only do it for your own communities, which, again, can be highly problematic. Uh, and how those beliefs should inform their behavior. And by the way, uh, so, so when people are using some logic in the live chat about the cannot believe and, and cannot know, Icarus, the problem with that is when you say you believe there's no God and you do not claim that... Um, there's, uh, you do not know there's no God. Um, that's a different thing than saying about the nobility of God, right? Because we cannot know. It's not the same proposition, right? So there's two propositions to be had there. If you think about this, there's a proposition, the ontological proposition, God exists. And then there's the epistemic question of, are gods knowable? So the proposition would be, gods can be known. And the, the negation of that would be, gods cannot be known. The agnostic holds no position either way. So it would actually be BP, not BP, and not K, not Q. Right? Because Q would have to be that secondary proposition. You cannot use P again because P is dealing with the ontological nature of God, the ontological stance of God. Q would be the epistemic question about God's knowability. So it would be God's are knowable. That would be Q. And if you look at my... my, my um, the logical ambiguity of, of, of agnostic atheist, I make that distinction. I show why it would have to be P and Q. Or whatever, you know, whatever atomic symbol you want to use, right? I mean, just, it's just generally speaking, it's P and Q. Yeah, and, and by the way, Icarus, I see that happen a lot. And, and I will tell you, I made the same mistake at one time, too. I actually, in, my, in my, one of my blogs, I was like writing it. And I'm like, no, dude, this can't be. And then, so I, I revised it. And yes, it, so yes, it's... It's one of those, and you know what's so funny? It go, this goes directly into analytical thinking. Gut instinct, right? Gut intuitions versus do you want to dive more into this? And I'm going to get into that a little bit after this, this video here. Sure, there are the atheists that will simply do whatever Richard Dawkins tells them to do because, let's be honest, human's gonna human. But there's just nothing that compares to a person going to the same church every Sunday and listening to the same preacher read from and interpret the same book over and over and over again from birth to death. People within the same religious sect will disagree, but on a population level, because of that consistent teaching, you can make certain assumptions about everyone who calls themselves Catholic, for instance. And you just can't do that with everyone who calls themselves atheist. Well, I bet. I bet you I sure can. Um, 
most atheists, generally speaking, when somebody says an atheist, one, I do know they're a non-believer, right? I do know that they, they will probably argue um, more science than non-science. I will I'll probably argue that they are um, not going to be fans of younger creationism. I'm going to probably argue that somebody who self-identifies as an atheist um, is probably going to say that they tend to critical thinking more. doesn't necessarily hold true. But these are things that you can probably make an educated guess about somebody who claims a particular label. Right? For that reason, we need research on that population to be way more in-depth and way better thought out than this. Personally, if I had to take that survey and pick either atheist or agnostic, I'd probably pick atheist just because it better describes the way that I walk around in the world and behave. And because... Okay. okay. Do you hear her justification for that? She said that she's probably going to pick atheist because that's how she walks around the world. But atheism is not how you walk around the world. Atheism is a position on the ontological status of God. She said at the very beginning, she believes there is no God. She set out at the very beginning, made it clear she believes there's no supernatural. She believes there's no unicorns. She believes there's no fairies or whatever. She believes no supernatural, no God. That's why she should say she's an atheist. Right? I'm an atheist. You would say I'm an atheist because I believe there's no God. But, that, but, but, but it, the, the question then is, do you really want to answer that way? Because when I'm asking somebody, why are they an atheist? I'm asking them the reasons why they come to the conclusion there's no God, right? I'm not asking them why they take a particular label. To me, it's a tautology to say I'm an atheist because I believe there's no God. That's tautological. It doesn't tell you anything. It's not informative, right? You know, it, it, it doesn't give you the reasons why you are an atheist. Not, not, not that, well, you pick the label, right? And people seem to not understand that. You know, it just, it just, it doesn't tell anybody anything if you say, oh, hey, why are you a vegetarian? Well, I'm a vegetarian because I don't eat meat. Okay, well, that's kind of, I kind of figured that out by the fact that you called yourself a vegetarian, right? That doesn't tell me anything about why you're actually a vegetarian. Are you an ethical vegan? Do you not like the taste of meat? I mean, what are the reasons why, right? So when you're asking somebody why they're an atheist, you, you know, do you really want to answer, oh, well, because, you know, I believe there's no God? Sure, that is true. It's tautological, but that at least would have been more consistent with what she said than saying I label myself an atheist because that's how I walk around the world. Well, atheism isn't about how you walk around the world. More people will understand what it means compared to, say, an agnostic. Way too many people think that agnostic just means you can't make up your mind. You're not sure what you believe, you know, and I never want to give. That's what it actually means, though. Rebecca, do your research. Go read more papers on atheism because what you just said is absolutely stupid. Agnostic does mean, in philosophy, somebody who's undecided. Go read Suspending Judgment by Dr. Jane Friedman. Go read Graham Oppie's work. Go read Draper's work. Go read McCormick's work. Go read Burgess Jackson's work. Go read um, Armstrong's work. Go read um, um, uh, Kuhn's work. Go read um, Sorber. Go read uh, all these different atheists. All of them. Grange. Uh, I mean, it boggles my mind that you sat there and just said too many people believe agnostic means undecided when that's actually what it is it, understood in the academic literature. Now, yes, there are other types of uses of terms. The terms are polysemous. So, yes, there are some people out there that use the term agnostic to talk about whether gods are knowable or not in the ep epistemological sense. Raper talks about that in his SCP article on atheism. But he also makes it very clear that atheism ought to be thought as, as the belief that God does not exist. And agnostic is somebody who neither believes as a God nor believes that there is a God. That's what agnostic is understood. And if you go read these papers, that's how they use these words almost every single time. That's, if you don't understand that, you're not going to understand any of these papers you read. You have to read it from the way they're using these terms of atheism as somebody who believes there's no God and agnostic as somebody who has no position either way. Because that is what it actually means in these contexts. So it isn't unfortunate that people think that way. That is how they should think of these terms if they want to read these papers in the, in the context of how they were written. People, the wrong impression that I lack convictions, God forbid, so to speak. Well, it's not a matter of lacking convictions. It's a matter of, because um, conviction is a matter of strength, right? Conviction is your strength of the magnitude of the balance of the position that you have. So she believes there is no God. 
okay, what's your conviction level on it? What, what is your strength of, uh, of this? Are you, are you somebody who's, um, you know, believes there's no God, but you claim also you know there's no God or you're certain there's no God? No, clearly I don't think she claims certitude I, or certainty. And I certainly don't think that she claims knowledge. But agnostic is not a measure of that. It's not an epistemic modifier to be used that way, right? She claims that there is no God. There, agnostic. I mean, atheist. Done. Simple. Uh, I think I have a lot of atheists and agnostics and, and other non-believers on this channel, so I'd be interested in seeing how you guys tend to self-identify and why. Comment below. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please. All right, so the rest is just her, her promoting her stuff. Um, but I did leave a, you know, a, a comment on her video, a couple comments um, about my position, right? Um, which, of course, I don't expect her to have an answer. I really don't. I just don't think she cares. Um, but let me, let's, so let's kind of dive into this a little bit and then I'm going to open this up for you guys to join. So let me get rid of this. So this was the actual source of the paper. Okay. Um, and this is called being agnostic, not atheist personality, cognitive and ideological differences. Now this paper, she gets into, uh, as, what she reads of it, it says, do, why do some non-religious people, seven identify agnostic and not, and, and not as atheist. Um, and she gets into these, these types of, of, cognitive issues that we would expect to find if people hold these particular labels we're dealing with neurotic neuroticism spiritualism dogmatism um and it does it does say that uh from a personality perspective agnostics comprise a very distinct psychological category and not just closet atheists meaning that most people that are self-identify as agnostics are not actually atheists who believe there's no gods just positing themselves as taking the term agnostic but actually agnostics who believe there is there's no justification that they have to believe one way or another. Now, the interesting part of this is if you, if you actually sort out the part she didn't see, show, I don't think, or at least didn't read very much about it, she says, uh, at first glance, the distinction oh, it says, why do many religious non believers self identify as agnostics instead of atheists? At first glance, the distinction seems merely epistemological. Actually, agnostics prefer not to affirm that God exists or that God does not exist, and to affirm that they do not know or we as humans cannot know, Lindemann, 2020, which I want to get into in a second. In other words, agnostics, there's two types. There's the ones that are undecided, but there's ones that go even further than that, and they talk about the knowability of gods, right? Because you cannot claim that you know there's a god, or know there's no god, and be agnostic. It doesn't make any sense, right? Because agnostic doesn't have position either way. Knowledge is a subset of belief. So these are just subsets of each other. Agnostics who say, um, I'm undecided, some of them have a subset of that that says, well, we also go to say that gods are unknowable. They're, they're all related in the agnosticism schema. But again, it's in the epistemological sense, not in the ontological sense. And then they say, atheists affirm that God does not exist. There you go. This paper is recognizing that atheism is the affirmation that there's no God. Now, there is some minute differences between affirming something and believing something. I'm not going to get into distinctions in this particular video um, about you know, speech act theory and things of that nature um, and assertoric force. But... You know, ostensibly, when you say that you affirm there's no God, you would it reasonably epistemically entails that you believe there's no God, right? You're not feigning it. You're not you're not being a dishonest actor or things of that nature, right? Um, you get the live chat there. Okay, sorry. Um, and so yeah, the paper is very clear what it means by this, right? Now, if you go to Lederman paper, right? Lederman, um, actually. Do I have Lederman? Hang on one second. Oh, I have this paper somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So, Lederman's paper, 2020, was it? It actually says, um, unbelievers <clears throat> may differ in their views of nature of knowledge and on the accepted justifications of knowing and believing. That is, in their epistemic stance. Consider, for example, the concepts of agnosticism. An, ideologically, an ideology entailing the belief that nothing is known or can be known of versus of atheism. As a prize to a belief in the non-existence or God of gods based upon Boulevant and Lee. Now, Boulevant is a theist. And Boulevant, um, uh, you know, generally advocates for weak atheism. But here, a belief in the non-existence of God would be atheist. Now, Lee is just mentioning that there is an epistemological sense of the term here. That's it, Right? Because the ideological aspect in the epistemic sense of agnosticism would possibly include about the nobility of gods. Because again, if you're undecided, you can't claim knowledge because knowledge is a subset of belief. Right? That's what Lederman was saying on this. 
But generally speaking, again, we're talking about agnosticism. We're not talking about the specific type of agnostics who hold about any position on the nobility of gods. We're talking about somebody who is undecided. Now, moving on from Lederman. <laughs> one of, the, one of the, um, the other papers mentioned here is Hunsberger. Um, and Hunsberger uh, wrote a, 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 a book uh, about atheists. And it was very clear because this paper cites, let me see if I can find the citation. Because it does cite Hunsberger. Uh, let me see where your site's set at. Uh, let me finish this real quick. I'll, I'll get to there. So beyond this epistemological differences, although one may conceive agnostics as being similar to and living as if they were atheist, for example, example, as indicated in recent studies, both groups seem to think that God and religion have no importance in their lives. Yeah. Well, agnostics are generally not going to live as if there's a God, right? That makes sense. Right? Not going to be, be going to church, that you know, things of that nature, generally speaking, right? And... They say it can even argue that agnosticism and atheism more over, may overlap, Gervais 2017. Now, Gervais wrote a blog on this, um, and again, not Ricky Gervais, but Will Gervais, and he's basically stating agnosticism as the knowability of gods. But again, he's a clinical psychologist. He's not a philosopher, and I think he makes some mistakes in his blog as far as his reasoning. Um, but it was just a blog that's being cited here, Okay. But, he, but, I mean, it's not, they're not wrong. If you want to use agnosticism in that usage, it's okay. But that's not how it's generally understood. Okay? And in that case, there might be some overlap. But in the ontological domain, agnosticism and atheism are mutually exclusive, clearly. Um, here. So, who are the agnostics? No research to our knowledge has specifically and inclusively investigated the question from a personality psychological perspective. With the very few exceptions, Hunsberger and Altmeyer, 2006. Now, um, Hunsberger actually says in the introduction of his book, <clears throat> a solid majority of North Americans believe in a God, according to polls. A few folks, like the authors of this book, say they honestly do not know and are called agnostics, meaning that they have no position either way. And every now and then you come across an atheist who positively says the negative. There is no God. They even recognize that... They don't have a belief either way. They don't know how to answer the question. It's not about whether they know God exists or not. It's, it's they don't know how to answer. Does God exist? I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. It's not, they're not asking about epistemic knowledge. They're asking about just ordinary doubt. They're asking about, do you have a position on this? Right? When you say yes, no, or I don't know, that's, that's just ordinary doubt. That's not talking about knowledge. I don't know how to answer the question. You know? Do you believe it's raining? And I, if I'm not outside, right? Let's say there's a 50% chance of raining today, and it says this may ask me, do, do you, you know, do, you know, is it raining? I'm like, I don't know. They're not asking me whether I know it's raining or not. They ask me if I can answer yes or no, a direct question, answer to the question, right? Now, if I look outside, if I open my windows, and I say it's raining, then yes, I believe it's raining. If it's not raining, then I say no, you know, or, or no, it's not raining. But until I, I, I can open my blinds, I don't have a position either way. You know, I'm agnostic on it, you know? So I, I would have to say, I don't know. But again, it's not talking about epistemic knowledge. It's talking about, I just don't know how to answer the question. I cannot give you a direct answer. That's what it means to say, I don't know. And again, I wrote a blog on this too about ordinary doubt. They also go on to say in their book, um, <clears throat> they, they do the study that they're referring to here. They, they talked about the possible answers that were given for the study. The three possible answers were provided. I am an atheist. I do not believe in the existence of this traditional God. I believe it does not exist. Now, again, they're being very specific to the Judo-Christianic Judo God, right? Which is fine. No, I mean, you could do a study like that. No big deal. Um, but generally speaking, when I'm using the term atheist, I'm using it as somebody who believes there are no gods. Okay, but in this particular study, they were talking about the Christian God for some particular reason. Okay, limited in scope. But it is the belief. It's the positive belief. It's not the lack of belief. Or, I'm an agnostic. I do not believe in the existence of this traditional God, nor do I disbelieve in it. Again, disbelief is understood in philosophy to believe the belief of the negation. It's not a, just, oh, I stared in disbelief, was unable to process something. That's a different usage of the term. If somebody says they disbelieve something in philosophy, they're saying to you, they hold the negation to be true. 
they hold a position that the proposition is false. That's what disbelief is understood. There's only three epistemic, rational epistemic positions to be had towards a proposition. Believe, disbelieve, which means to believe false, or suspend judgment, which is the agnostic. Now, there's another disposition out there, which is believe both, but of course, believing both something true and false is a contradiction in classical logic. Maybe not so much in other uh, logics, like in paraconsistent logic, but, you know, um, in, in classical logic, that'd be a contradiction. Um, and, you know, it's funny in the paper, in the paper I'm not going to go back to it, but in the paper that you're describing, um, they do talk about uh, that agnostics are tend, are, may tend more to not be so stringent when it comes to the law of extruded middle. And that may be true because there are logics out there that have what's called truth gaps. And these truth gaps allow for something other than true or false. And there's, there's other types of logics out there. They're not just classical logic. And so some logics don't have law of excluded middle. Some of them have law of, don't have the law of non-contradiction, right? A Paris consistent or theistic logic allows for true contradictions without principle of explosion. So, and then the third one would be, I'm a theist. I believe in the existence of this traditional God. Agnostic, atheist, or theist. Very distinct, mutually exclusively, and jointly exhaustive in this, in this schema system. Right? So they were very clear what they meant by this in the study. Because that's what they wanted to know. They wanted to know somebody's epistemic disposition toward the Christian God. Believe, disbelieve, again, to believe false, and uh, or have no position either way. Matter of fact, Matt Dillahunty berated a caller one time for saying that they that disbelieved meant that you believe there's no gods. And he just, just berated them. But the guy was absolutely right. He's like, oh, disbelief just means you don't have belief. No, go look at the go look go look at anywhere in the literature. Now, there is some ambiguity with the word disbelief because of that very reason, because some people may use it in a colloquial sense. But that ambiguity only arises because different words have different usages between the colloquial sense and more of a stringent sense. But in philosophy, if you're talking about atheism, why would you not be in the philosophical sense? Because atheism is a philosophical term. In this case, you would you use belief because Matt Dillahunty recognizes that belief is a positive status. He holds the belief there are no gods. I got in a discussion or argument with somebody on Facebook. Was like, oh no, he's never said he doesn't believe. Or he never said there's no gods. Want a bet? I gave him two sources, two videos. I'm saying, yeah, I believe there are no gods. That's his position. So there's a reason why you have these very distinct positions of atheist, agnostic, and theist because they represent the three epistemic statuses or dispositions you can have towards a proposition: believe, disbelieve, and neither believe. Uh, believe or disbelieve, not believe or uh, believe or not uh, disbelieve. All right, and again, I didn't want to get too much on the paper because go read the paper for yourself. But I mean, you get the gist of the paper. The paper is just trying to relate psychological aspects of, of open mindedness and, and and dogmatism towards these particular groups. That's it. And again, I don't think I need to go through the whole paper to do that. Um, now we're gonna have a little fun here. I'm gonna open this up and then I'm gonna get into some of the reasons why I think it was important to talk about. Um, a analytical atheism and things of that nature. I found that to be one of the more interesting aspects of this particular paper. Let me give you guys a link to join if you want to join. I'm going to put it in the, in the live chat right now. All right, that's the link. I'm going to pin it to the top. All right, so come on in if you want to join in the conversation because we're going to have a little fun here. All right. So one of the things that I mentioned in this paper was talking about a analytical atheism and wanted to see if analytical atheism, uh, atheists tended to have um, cognitive biases, tended to have cognitive predispositions to have whether uh, gut instinct reactions or to really rationally think about certain things, whether they had a propensity to or predisposition to. That's a really interesting question because um, one, I'm not against gun instinct. I think that we use gun instinct quite frequently. I think it uh, is, is necessary in certain lines of work, such as um, police officers use gun instinct. Um, I do loss prevention now, prevention for, for months. And I got to tell you, I rely very heavily on gut instinct. And me and one other person have gotten to be pretty, pretty well substantiated that our gun instincts are right. Um, why? Because... Gut instincts are based upon subliminal things a lot of times. Things our brains might not even process. 
uh, directly. We, we, they're not a very, it may not be on current beliefs. It may just be dispositional things. But we notice things about behaviors. And when we see certain behaviors, we recognize that this person might be doing something shady, right? Might be concealing, might be, um, uh, you know, shoplifting. Um, might be doing uh, internal thefts and things of that nature. So, yes, when you're in certain fields like loss prevention, you should trust your gun instinct, right? Because you may not act on the gun instinct, right? You, you don't want to, like, you know, act inappropriately. But it gives you that little flag in your head going, maybe I need to pay more attention to this. And almost, almost every single time it pans out. I mean, almost scarily so. Because I actually am good at what I do. I was loss prevention certified uh, in, in other companies. But they want to know about the analytical atheism conjecture. So here we're going to get a little um, uh, education here. Education mode. Pedological. Cream. Uh, and I'm going to have to do this so I can see if you guys come in or not. I'm not expecting anybody to do, but you're welcome to. And watch the live chat. Uh, All right, so the analytical atheist, analytic atheist conjecture is, are analytical thinkers less religious than people who follow their gut intuition? This is one thing that, that came out of that paper that I think she just totally blew off because she's talking about how this was a mess. Well, she didn't understand the paper because people who claim to be analytical thinkers, like scientists, right, do they tend to be less religious? Eh, not so much, maybe. I mean, there's a lot of scientists out there that are very religious, right? Now, I've had uh, people say, well, you know, all these, you know, science and religion go hand in hand. And a lot of, you know, ancient um, scientists were religious. Well, yeah, most because that was very high religiosity in those days, right? We don't know if Newton or Leibniz or um, Ptolemy or uh, any of, of those, you know, scientists, Copernicus, we don't know what they would have believed in the modern age, knowing what they know, know about now about cosmogony and astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, you know, again, back in the Gnostic days, to go back to the Gnosticism, they believed that there was these seven realms, these seven principalities, these seven luminaries that were these celestial spheres out there. That's why they, that's how these names of the planets came about. And so they were very religious when it came to that. They, they, they were very spiritual. Most of the, you know, the Gnostics believed in this divine spark, the hidden knowledge. But we don't know if these, and if any of the scientists back in those days would be science, would be religious nowadays, knowing what they know. We just don't know. But they wanted to know um, if analytical th thinkers are less religious. Which I thought was really the, a, a great question, right? And I'm not going to get into the papers themselves about whether, whether they determine. Um, but basically, um, they, 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 they did conclude that it's not so much the case. Yeah, just because somebody claims to be an analytical thinker, it doesn't really show a diminished... Um, Religiosity. It doesn't really show that people who tend to analytical thinking are less religious. Now, one of the questions they ask is a very interesting question. It's a question that's been around for a very long time. If you, I don't know if you, you've seen something like this, right? Um, and the question was, is called a, ball and, a bat and ball problem. Uh, it goes like this. One, it gives you two, two, um, two things. One, a bat and a ball cost $1. ten in total. Okay. Two, a bat costs a dollar more than the ball. Okay, these are two things that are information given to us. The question's simple. How much does the ball cost? What, do you, what would you guys say the answer is? And again, they wanted to know if people are going to, you know, just go with their gut, answer, you know, gut instinct. Or are they going to overanalyze, underanalyze? What are they going to do, right? Because you can either go with your, you know, go with your gut, don't go with your gut. Um, overanalyze it or underanalyze it, right? This is, again, going into critical thinking and critical analysis. Very specifically, this went into what's called cognitive, um, cognitive reflection. Uh, so the cognitive reflection test, um, and this was given uh, by, by a psychologist named Frederick, and the psychologist was trying to, to see if people will reflect upon their own cognitive biases. If they were have reflections of their own um, cognitive awareness of answers to questions, and generally he he put them into two categories: system one and system two, and said, okay, um, system one people generally go with their gun instinct without self any kind of reflection, but system two go into a little more conscious 
thought about these, these things. So that's what they were trying to determine by the cognitive reflection test. So what do you guys think? What's the answer to this? And let me see if anybody can. No, nobody, any guys want to come in? Oh, by the way, you, is, you, can you guys not see this? I'm not, I'm not showing on my outside feed. Oh, it is. Okay, it is. No. What do you guys answer? Give me an answer. Somebody give me an answer. What's the answer to this question? How, many, how much does the ball cost? The bat and ball cost $1.10 in total, and the ball cost $1 more than the bat. How much does the ball cost? Again, you can, you can go with your gut instinct. You can not go with your gut instinct. You can overanalyze or analyze. Okay, so April Von Rand answered the question. She says, in my, uh, uh, oh no, sorry, Christopher answered the question. He says, I'm really stupid when it comes to this kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, stop it. No, you're not. Um, if the bat is a dollar and the ball 10, 10 cents. Okay, so uh, Christopher answers 10 cents, right? Uh, April Van answers 10 cents. Okay. Any other purple want to weigh in? And, and I would probably venture to guess that both of you guys are giving your gut instinct on this, right? You're, just, you're reading the question. Doesn't really, you know, you're not really giving any cognitive reflection on it. Um, and one thing that, you know, a lot of people that do math, when they do a problem and they get an answer, they put the answer back in the equation to see if it, it matches. They, they ask themselves, is this a reasonable answer? Or is it something that just doesn't make sense as far as the question? Right? We, we did this in nuke school a lot. Every time you did a problem and you got an answer, you substitute that answer back in the original problem and you kind of self-check it and you see if it makes sense. Because if you come up with some, let's say if I come up with an answer that is negative, like negative volume of something like that, I probably screwed up somewhere along the lines. Why? Because I shouldn't have a, 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 a question about the volume of something based upon pressure and temperature and, and Boyle's law and Charles' law and come up with an answer of negative volume. Why? Because volume can't be negative. It, the answer doesn't make sense, right? So you should pause and say, does this answer make sense? Okay, Gumby 12, 12, 10, 12 says $1. five and five cents, okay? Now, Gumby probably went beyond a, a, a gut instinct and said, does this make sense? Does the answer that, that April and um, Chris gave made, made sense? Well, let's ask ourselves. If the answer is 10 cents, and the bat costs a dollar more than the bat, or excuse me, the ball, uh, the ball costs 10 cents, and the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, well, the ball is only 10 cents. That's only a 90 cent difference, right? The bat is a dollar and the ball is 10 cents. That's a 90 cents difference. That's not a dollar more. That violates the second premise. Because again, the bat is a dollar more than the ball. If the ball is 10 cents, then the bat should be a dollar 10, coming up with a total of $1.20, but that doesn't make any sense. So the, the, the people that have the, the system two, the ones that do a little more self-reflection, come up with this answer. And I've done the math, um, and I hope I did it right. Um, and I just did it as enumeration, right? I just did it as, you, when you do a problem, you just kind of lay out this way. So uh, bat and the ball is $1.10, and the bat minus $1 equals the ball. Okay, this is how the, the one and two. So if you substitute bat and ball for two variables, x and y, you come up with x and y have to total $1.10. x minus y has to be a dollar. Why? Because the difference between the ball and the bat is a dollar. The bat is a dollar more than the ball. Which means that the bat is the, the total of the, of the ball plus a dollar. So that gives you one plus yy, which is... Uh, by substitution, so you end up with a dollar ten because if you, if you add everything together, it's going to have the total. So you, that, you just then you just take two y's together, you get two y equals ten cents. Divide that by two on either side, and you get five cents. Which means that the the bat is five cents. And so the bat is a dollar five, and the ball is a nickel because the do, the bat is a dollar more than the ball. If, if the ball is five cents and the bat is a dollar more, that's a dollar five, giving you a total of a dollar ten. See, right? So, generally speaking, when it comes to these types of problems, critical thinkers don't stop and, and pause. Um, some people that claim to be critical thinkers don't stop and pause and reflect to make sure that that this the answer made sense. Now, I'm not saying that Chris and April are not critical thinkers. That's not at all what I'm implying. Um, but I'm just saying for the study that they're trying to do. They wanted to see 
if people that were critical thinkers on this um, analytical atheist were more apt to, to have some self-reflection or cognitive reflection. So does that make sense? So in this particular problem, the SE answer is, the correct answer is $1.5 and 5. In this case, the gut instinct answer is incorrect. Which I thought was kind of interesting, right? Now, they also a little bit get into, and they don't talk about this in the paper specifically, but I thought it was an interesting thing. Talk about the four types of systems of the mind, or the four types of uh, generalities of the mind. And this was the breakdown of people that generally would be more analytical, logical, as opposed to creative, as opposed to sequential. And where do you kind of, you know, put yourself um, on this type of a, on this type of a, system right and so i thought this diagram was pretty interesting like i, I thought I, I had it here so i can kind of go over because i can't see it on my own diagram <laughs> i looked i was looking at it and i i blew up larger could I actually see it oh here it is um actually you know what i got a better picture than this one there we go i like this one better so, so the four quadrants of the mind were analytical, sequential, internal imaging, and feelings, right? And I do think that a lot of people break themselves down in this type of system, right? I tend to be more analytical, decision-making, non-emotional interactions. I think people that know me would probably say that I would be following that green quadrant, right? But there are more people that are better at um, sequential organizations, people that are more very, very organized uh, I'm not. I'm not that organized, right? They very. They value their time a lot more, time-saving methods, right? Um, and then, of course, the internal imaging, which is more abstract concepts. People know I suck at abstracts, like creativity, right? Not very innovative. Now, when I'm writing a paper or something like that or write an essay, yeah, there's some abstract thinking going on there. There's some innovation. There's and some amusement. I play games. But I do tend to be more analytical in my approach to the, like these types of reviews. I'm not basing them on feelings, which would be the blue thing, right? Highly empathetic. Uh, non-verbal understandings, relationships, harmony, and nature, nurturing, which, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think we all have some degree of these things, right? But what do we probably tend to the most? In this case, for me, analytical. doesn't mean we're not empathetic. doesn't mean that we're not uh, valuing harmonious relationships. Matter of fact, one of the things that paper was talking about pro-social, um, things that agnostics tend to be. And agnostics being pro-social would probably want to develop harmonious relationships. doesn't always happen. Right, probably because people disagree on these arguments vehemently, and they get into personal differences. And of course, we see what happens on those types of channels, <laughs> right? Um, but I thought this was pretty interesting because this is what it's talking about in that particular paper when it came to um, an, uh, analytical atheism and, and talking about cognitive um, reflection. And I just think that that uh, that Rebecca completely missed the point of the paper because she doesn't dive into any of that stuff. She doesn't ask for them herself, why are we talking about why agnostics are more, maybe no, more neurotic because they don't want to make decisions on things uh, without having sufficient reason. Doesn't mean they're indecisive, right? But I mean, I don't want to make a decision on something at work unless I have specific reasons to do so, especially in loss prevention. I do go by my gut instinct. So, it's not to, to have the idea there's one size fits all, but it's just asking about the propensity of what we would expect to find given somebody labels themselves atheist or agnostic or theist. We would find that theists and agnostics do tend to be more dogmatic, which is to be expected. And that's what this paper was talking about. So while the paper itself didn't really, to me, tell me anything I wouldn't expect, it wanted to see if was, these things held true. And I think, again, Rebecca just didn't understand that. Uh, the fact that when she starts off her, her video talking about agnostic atheists, I think she already lost the plot. Because, again, we've already, we've already shown that agnostic atheism is absolutely silly. Um, but anyways, what did you guys you know, think about this? Leave, leave me a comment on, on the review of what you think. Let me know if you think I did an adequate job. Um, I'm trying, again, not to come from a, a feeling point of view. But I, you know, I have feelings on this. I think she's absolutely wrong. I don't think she's ever going to correct herself. I certainly know that other people have that pontificated on these particular topics like Ricky Gervais and um, 
uh, Jack and Glenn never corrected their stuff. They don't know anything about philosophy, even though Ricky Gervais took courses in philosophy. He studied philosophy in college. But he ne they never address anything that I talk about. Why? Because the psych citations and the academic literature just doesn't support their position. It doesn't support anything that they're talking about. Oh, oh I got one person who wanted to join. All right. Trent, we got Trent Owen here. Hey, Trent, how you doing, man? Hola, como estas? Trent, can you, can, you, can, you, can you hear me? I'm not muted in, in live streams. Trent, going once, going twice. I can see you in live chat there. Did you, did you go, try to fix your mic there, Trent? Because I can't hear you. So let me look in the live chat here while Trent's trying to figure out his mic. Um, and go from there. One second. Um, Kimo says, I won't comment on German meticulousness or efficiency since I'm not qualified in any way to do so, but I've not heard any objection from any Canadian to the jettison of the penny. <laughs> I like that because I was going to do a stream on that one of these days about should we get rid of the penny in America? Penny, I, you know, but whatever. April says, why would Ricky Gervais correct himself? He's a comic, not a philosopher. Yeah, I agree. But he talks about philosophy stuff and he has a big audience. Rebecca Watson has an audience. And she's putting out ignorant information. Ignorant. Because nothing she talked about has anything to do with how we understand these terms in philosophy. And then she just throws her own two cents about what she wants these to believe about these positions and agnostic atheism. And I'm telling you right now, if you're an atheist and you're self-identifying as an agnostic atheist and you're talking to somebody who's well-versed in philosophy, the ones I talk to, probably going to think you're an idiot. Probably. They may not tell you to your face, but I'm telling you right now they're going to think that. Because I, as you know, I talked to a lot of philosophers. And not one of them, not one of them uses the, that, that, those types of, of terminologies. They think it's silly. Every one of them. Now, there might be some ones, there are very few that says that they just don't care. No, that's, that's fine. But, you know, in the philosophical sphere, most of them um, are really against this this new atheism stuff, uh, this really against this dogmatic thinking, because new atheism is dogmatism. Uh, it is religiosity. It is cult-like thinking. I'm sorry, but it is. And I am not against atheism. I really support atheists for, for, for liberty because um, they're a secular society. Um, I support the satanic temple to some degree. They're, they're atheist. They believe there are no gods. They believe that gods don't exist. They believe, they believe that supernatural is BS. But they do so in a way to, to promote politics in a way that says, look, if you're going to allow for Christian prayer in school, you have to have it open for all. You have to allow for satanic prayer in school. Or church or city hall. Arn Ra took advantage of this and in some meeting led the satanic prayer. Good on him. Why? Because it shows that there needs to be a separation of church and state. Do I think that Arn Ra wants to go and, and have a satanic prayer in every city hall meeting? Right? Or in every church? No, of course not. It's not, it's not the point of it. The point is to show if you allow for one, you have to allow for the other. The Christians have opened the gate on this. That's what the satanic temple has shown people. That they've opened the gate to allow vastly different uh, uh, ideologies and viewpoints to them. Which includes satanism. And I think that's funny. I think it's funny. You know? So, I mean, yeah, I think the Titanic Temple makes a good points on that. You know? Uh, Satan has run me the wrong way. Iron Ra is making me cringe. Well, and I, and I get that to a degree, Sling. But the reason why, because Iron Ra, I don't think he even understands that concept too much, right? He's not, he, yes, I think he's doing it to, to show the point of that. But at the same time, he's kind of being a dick about it in a way, yeah. But that's, again, a lot of the things that do include the Satanism, they do mo mockery. But that's more of the, the do I see, I see a mockery in a lot more of the Temple of Satan, or the, the um, Church of Satan, than I do the Satanic Temple. I think the Satanic Temple is a lot more politicized. I think they, they're not really into that mockery that much. Right? And when they, if they do do mockery, they do it on a very high level, like the Statue of Bahamut, right? That is a form of mockery, but it's a very poignant Form of mockery, or the big, you know, big satanic book of color activities for kids, or something like that. That's a very high level of mockery, right? R is not on that high level of mockery. I is R and Ron, a lot of the atheists from American Atheist and Atheist Republic, on the very low level, meme level 
a mockery. Yeah, you got a sky daddy. Pfft. Oh, shut up, right? It's just, it's just, come on. There's different levels to be had there. All right, so, Trent, you want to try again? Still can't hear you, man. You see it trying, though. Not muted in the stream. You're not muted here. I can see it. I can see it too, but I just, I don't hear you. I don't know why. Let me come back in. Let me try that. Okay, I'm, I'm re-entering Streamyards. You guys can't see it, so. All right, let me try it now. Can you hear me? No, I can't hear you. Well, I have to save this for another day, Trent. I'm sorry, but I, I just can't hear you. I'm going to be ending the stream. I'm be ending the stream yards. You're welcome to join another time, Trent. Leave, leave me a comment about what you want to talk about. Maybe I'll even start a um, new Hangout. Not today, but at a future date. And uh, if stream yards doesn't work, we use like Google Hangouts, okay? So, all right. So, again, I'm going to end this. It has been you know, a lot longer than I intended. Uh, but that's how my streams go. Uh, but let me know what you think. Let me know about you think of my review. Read the paper and give your own critique, your own analysis. Again, I didn't get very much in depth of the paper because there was no need to. Um, just the this part that she read showed me that she didn't understand the purpose of the paper. Um, but I do want to know what you guys think about it. And also, I would really appreciate it if you can share these videos out there. Get them on social media. This channel doesn't get a lot of views. I get that. But for the people that are interested in philosophy, they might want to be aware of these things. They want might, might want to be aware that people that are self subscribed as skeptics. I mean, Rebecca Watson is known as Skeptic. That is her name, her nickname, Skeptic. That is her uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what do they call it? A moniker, right? Her soliloquy. So that's what she goes by, Skeptic. Uh, which promotes probably what you would think, skeptical thinking. And I will tell you, and I will go on record, and again, I have nothing against Rebecca Watson. I mean, well, okay, we've got to go into the feminist stuff, maybe, but it's just irrelevant here, right? I don't care whether she's a feminist. I don't care if she's a woman, male. That makes no difference. Because somebody actually said, hey, Steve, you do a video on Rebecca Watson, you're going to have all these feminists ask you. Oh, well, I've had that for ages. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. But I don't care about any of that. What I care about for this particular video, or at least for, for this video, I only care that she's talking about a topic that she sounds ignorant upon. That she doesn't read any of the other academic literature on this because she didn't understand the paper in context. And she's putting out to people gross misinformation. And again, if you talk to somebody and they tell you agnostic dealings is knowledge, ask for a citation beyond a simple Google foo you know, etymological diagram. Say, where in, in philosophy is, is knowledge used, this, or uh, gnosis or agnostic used this way in the literature? Where? It, it isn't. It just simply isn't. Matter of fact, the only place agnostic atheism even mentioned in really in any kind of academic literature in any degree, matter of fact, is in a book called Agnosticism, which was written by uh, Robert Flint in 1903. And he's not even talking about agnosticism and atheism as we understand it today. He's talking about Thomas Huxley's version of agnosticism as a scientific method or a normative scientific principle, which was early uh, scientific methodology or even close to evidentialism. That's what he's referring to. So the term agnostic atheism in 1903 is not how Rebecca Watson or anybody else is using it in modern day at all. Why? Because term, you know, things change, terms change, but nowhere else do you find the term agnostic atheism in the literature. So uh, Chris Green says, yeah, I don't like it either. Uh, atheists say tennis act like they're the only game in town. Theistic Satanists do not. Yeah, well, theistic Satanists um, generally tend to be more what's called Luciferians. They don't really want to be called Satanists because now there's two groups out there, the, the Church of Satan and the t Satanic Temple. The Satanic Temple eschews any kind of supernatural. They, they just think it's all BS. But the, the Church of Satan does have some supernatural overtones to it. They do believe in occultic magic, chaos magic, right? The thing with them is they don't describe where that magic comes from. They don't even just say how it works. They, some of them believe it's psychological. Right? They believe that chaos magic works because of the psychological influence it has over the individual and other people, which would be no supernaturalism. It would be all natural, but it's mind manipulation. Occult magic to them is mind manipulation. But some of them actually do believe there's some kind of supernatural component to it. So the Church of Satan, uh, uh, the Church of Satan is very different from the Satanic Temple. Very, very different organizations. 
So, uh, yeah, LeVay and Corrali certainly tailor their themes to result in maximal potential to get them laid. <laughs> yeah, uh, chemo, I agree with you on that. They're very, very hedonistic, very, very sexually exploitive. But I, w- I, I do like this. In the satanic um, beliefs, consent is everything. And you find that in BDSM. You find that in, in a lot of different things. Consent is all. And they do believe that um, unwanted advancements is evil. So, you know, I, I think, matter of fact, if you go read the tenets of the Satanic Temple, they're very humanistic. And the, a lot of them are very more Christian than some Christian beliefs. You know, so it, it's, I, I, find, I find it fascinating. I'm not, I'm not a Satanist. I don't claim to be a Satanist. But I do have an affinity toward Satanism in that aspect of how they recognize uh, humanism and how they recognize that there needs to be a secular society. There needs to be separation of church and state. There needs to be this division that if you do break the wall and then you have prayer in school or prayer in meetings uh, in church, in, in, excuse me, in a city hall, you have to allow for things like the statue of Bath and and if you allow for the Ten Commandments or the satanic prayer as opposed to the Lord, Lord's Prayer. You cannot discriminate one against the other. Why? Because of freedoms for all the first amendment right if you if you want to uphold the first amendment then that's how it'd be now again there's time place and manner you, that has to be you can't just say a prayer anytime you want you know in a church you know in, in a city hall meeting you can't just stop the meeting and say i want to do a prayer right it's time place and manner but if you allow for one you have to give equal time to the other if they so want it you can't discriminate you can't say, hey, I'm going to allow Christians to lead a prayer, but I won't allow Satanists to do so. But the Satanists will tell you, at least as far as the Satanic Temple, they want it all removed. They'd be happy to say, oh, you banned us from doing prayer? We'll ban the Christians from doing it as well. And we're going to go away happy. That's their goal. <laughs> they want secularism like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I think a lot. I think Arn may have maybe lost the plot on that. I don't know. I haven't talked to him about it. Um, I haven't talked to him in years. Um, but, but to me, he t- I think Aaron makes more of the, of the mockery sense of it rather than anything else. But again, you know, maybe not. I mean, I, I listened to his 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 speech at the, when he gave that city council stuff, and I, you know, I, I didn't disagree with him. You know, I, I think he did recognize at that point it is for the, the sake of if you allow one for the other. I think it, you know, obviously he does recognize it because he, he talks about it. But I think he does do a lot of more mockery because he's one of those people that won't mock religion, and he believes that religion is open to mockery. Right, and this was one of the fundamental tenets, I think, of new atheism, that religion should be mocked. Um, which, again, anybody can mock anything, but you know, I just find it trite. If you if you're going to tell a theist, hey, you know, um, you're a doo doo head for believing there's a god, you know, or you know, you're you're just believing a magical sky daddy, okay. But, you know, that's bottom of the barrel stuff. It's not going to get you anywhere. Any idiot can do that. Now, if you go to a theist and say, a theist, you know, I believe that you're wrong. I believe there's no gods. And let me give you, uh, you know, an argument, you know, for the, the evidential problem of evil, that the, the this god that you worship may not even be for global atheists, but this god that you worship is doesn't exist. You know, it's incongruent with the logical problem of evil. Right? That particular god can exist logically. And so... I, I think that there's different levels of these, these activists out there that are out there. And I have a lot of respect for the high-level ones. I, I know a lot of them. You know, um, go, work, go watch the, eighth, um, the eighth, uh, Atheology um, podcast, you know, with Ben Speed Watkins. Uh, go watch Answers and Reasons with Joe and Dave. Those guys are really good. Um, go listen. Go, go subscribe to the, Theoretical Bullshit, uh, a.k.a. Scott Clifton. Um, you guys may know Scott Clifton. He's an, he was an actor on General Hospital, Bold and the Beautiful. Um, and uh, he's also a philosophy guy. And, you know, so um, go listen to those guys. They really know, know what they're talking about. Call it Jejun, not just Pearl. <laughs> it's both. It's, it's Pearl and Jejun. Um, I often even say that a lot of time. I even say these types of, of, of things are Pearl and Jejun. Because I think they gotta go hand in hand. Uh, uh, Sex addict says, "Can you, Steve? Could you do another video on the problem of evil? It's a hot topic right now. I could, but I mean, I did a two-hour video on the problem of evil. Man, <laughs> go look up my 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 discography. I did a two-hour video on the, the both the evidential and the logical problem of evil. I started with the logical, but then I moved into the evidential problem of evil. But yeah, I mean, we can talk about it again as far as, as, far as like the theodicies. The theodicies actually, you know, resolve." 
these um, these issues. I don't think that they do. I think they may in some cases to some degree, but I think Plantinga overextends it when he gets into the, the evidential problem of evil. Um, so, you know, yeah, we can talk about one of these days again. But anyways, this is going way too long, and I'm hot as hell. So I'm going to end this. I want to thank you guys for being uh, viewers. I want to thank you guys for being members of the channel. I want to thank you guys for being Patreons. Um, I have noticed a few people have become Patreons, and I, you know, I am promoting my Patreon for this channel and my Patreon, especially for the Non Sequitur Show. Um, if you want to become a Patreon, go find the Non Sequitur Show or go find the um, Steve McRae and become a Patreon. Link is in the video description. Um, I'm not sure which one I prefer. I don't know. If you like philosophy, become a patron on this channel. If you like the, the shows we do on the Non Sequitur, then, then become a patron on the Non Sequitur show. Or become a member of the channel. You get a little cool green name. Um, I really do appreciate it. I am trying to self promote. It's not going very well because people know I suck at it, but I got to try. Um, but with that, I have. Hang on, hang on one sec. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I just got a I just got a call from Alexis from my roommate Cano. <laughs> she's she's working. Um, so I apologize for that. But I, I'm not going to not take my call from Alexis. Um, hey Alexa, what's the temperature? Right now, it's 103 degrees. 103 degrees, and that's cool here. Expect a low of 85 yeah. degrees. Hey Alexa, what's the definition of atheist? Atheist is usually defined as. A person who denies or disbelieves the existence of a supreme being or beings. Good night.